A tangled mass of yarn and ribbon sounds more like what you'd find in the back room of a craft store or a forgotten closet than a mysterious creature worthy of investigation. And yet that's exactly what SCP-066 appeared to be, or at least it did at first glance. But the SCP Foundation doesn't contain and study just anything, and there was, and still is, something incredibly strange just below the surface of SCP-066, also known as Eric's Toy. At first, Eric's toy seemed to be completely harmless and even helpful, a knot of string that produced strange but harmless items and effects. But the Foundation soon discovered a dark side to SCP-066. While it may be referred to as a toy, this is no mere plaything. SCP-066 weighs only about one kilogram and appears to be a braided bunch of yarn and ribbon. Though there is no apparent musical capability within the strands of yarn and ribbon themselves, music can be produced by moving individual strands one at a time. When it was first being studied, this SCP was composed of multicolored strings and ribbons, but it has since undergone a transformation and now presents an appearance somewhat different from its initial description. The strands of yarn and ribbon can be used to play the notes of a diatonic scale, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, though the research has not been able to determine just how SCP-066 produces music or any sound at all. SCP-066 was thought to be completely benign at first and was classified as safe, but following an incident known as Incident 066-2, its classification was adjusted to a subcategory of Euclid, Euclid Impetus. Euclid is a classification given to SCPs that are more difficult to contain than those classified as safe. Impetus in Latin means attack, and specifies that SCP-066 is not only Euclid class, but on the more aggressive side. While 066 is not always aggressive towards humans, the events of Incident 066-2 prove that it is highly unpredictable and should not be provoked. Like many SCPs, it proved that underestimating its capabilities can be a dangerous mistake. Before the incident, SCP-066 displayed only charming, if unusual, behavior. Various researchers spent their time playing random assortment of notes using its strings, curious about what would happen, and determined to record anything this unusual ball of string had to offer. They did not yet know that the creature was capable of any hostility, and went about their work with a lighthearted, carefree spirit. After playing an improvised six-note melody with the strands, a researcher was thrilled to find that SCP-066 was capable of shape-shifting. Its appearance changed to resemble a small calico kitten for 17 minutes. The kitten was incredibly friendly, rubbing its head against the researcher's glove hand and purring loudly. Ironically enough, the kitten also spent time playing with a piece of string. After the 17 minutes were up, the kitten transformed back into SCP-066's original form. A few days later, another researcher played a different melody on the strands and was surprised to find that, when they stopped, the music continued on its own. The sound of an acoustic guitar kicked in, accompanied by vocals with no visible source for either sound. The SCP then played a four-minute song with lyrics warning against the use of sharp objects without the supervision of a parent, especially scissors. After the song ended, the SCP was silent for the rest of the day. The following week, a research assistant used the strands of SCP-066 to play the opening notes of Happy Birthday, and a chocolate cupcake with a lit birthday candle appeared from within the braided strings. Against the warning of his peers, the assistant ate the cupcake. In response, the SCP played the rest of Happy Birthday, and the assistant suffered no adverse effects from the cupcake. All of this fun was brought to a swift end when one scientist suggested that a portion of SCP-066's yarn body be cut off and removed so that the specimen could be tested. On April 18, 2008, the event that would become known as Incident 066-2 took place. A young man known only as D-066-4437, or D, was assigned to the task. Naturally, he was a member of the highly disposable D-class personnel. But D was grateful for the opportunity, as most experiments of a similar nature involved quite a bit more obvious risk. It was a simple enough job. Take a pair of scissors, snip off some yarn, and bring it back to the lab for further study. It was hardly on the level of supervising 173, or being 682's latest chew toy. He entered the containment room, where SCP-066 was lying dormant and still, and approached it with scissors. He grabbed a small handful of string and started to cut. As soon as the scissors began to cut through the fabric, the SCP rolled out of his grasp. It came to a stop one meter away, where it started to make a high-pitched squeaking sound resembling the cry of a frightened rabbit. 
Unsure what to do and unprepared for this scenario, D approached the entity again. He snagged another fistful of yarn and cut, only for 066 to curl into a ball and roll away from him again, even faster this time. Once it was safely on the other side of the room and away from the scissors, it stopped moving. Only this time, it didn't squeak. Instead, for the very first time since its containment, it spoke in a deep, uncannily human voice and asked, Are you Eric? After recovering from his initial shock at hearing a voice come out of a massive string, D responded, No, I'm not. This answer said something off in SCP-066, and its form began to shift and change. The string wriggled around on the floor, unbraiding and wrapping around itself into a mound. The colors, previously a rainbow of shades, shifted until every strand was a blood red. Much to Dee's horror, the transformation was not yet complete. Small bumps began to emerge from the spaces between the strands of yarn, popping out all over the bright red mass. If that wasn't terrifying enough, suddenly, all together as one, they blinked open, revealing themselves to be over a dozen small eyes. Every single eye was focused at D, studying him, staring him down. SCP-066 then began to produce loud, abrupt, dissonant notes like someone banging on the keys of a piano. D had seen enough. He abandoned his task and fled the containment room. After this failed attempt to extract a sample, SCP-066's behavior and its treatment of personnel who interacted with it began to change dramatically. Before the incident, the SCP was largely dormant, only becoming active if a melody was played using its strands. Following the incident and its change of form, 066 began to move on its own. Long strands of its yarn body would move like tentacles, writhing and wriggling around at high speed. It no longer needed human interaction in order to produce sound or to produce any other effects. At the sight of any human, regardless of the human's behavior, the SCP would begin to react with sound and effect within six seconds. The first of these effects was noted by a research assistant who entered the SCP's containment facility a week after the incident with D. As she approached 066 to take notes about its current state and its new ability to move, a bee appeared out of nowhere. It stung the assistant and flew away before it could be captured. Weeks later, a team of 11 personnel were monitoring the SCP when it suddenly burst into a rendition of Beethoven's Second Symphony. It produced this music at a volume of over 140 decibels, permanently deafening three of the personnel and causing permanent hearing damage in the other eight. It was theorized that the SCP did this as an act of retribution for its perceived mistreatment. These personnel refused to work with SCP-066 again. When a new team was assigned to monitor the entity, everything seemed to be going well at first. It was moving around, flailing its tentacles of yarn at nothing in particular and staring at the personnel with its many eyes, but otherwise was on its best behavior. Then, suddenly, every light in the room went dark and there was a complete loss of visibility. The lights were unable to be turned on for five hours, and any attempt at an alternate light source, such as a flashlight, was unsuccessful. It was as if the darkness in the room swallowed any and all light right up. It was similar to the oppressive darkness within SCP-087, or the unlimited black of SCP-3001's shadow dimension. The personnel in the room later reported hearing the sound of loud, labored breathing just behind their shoulders, though when they searched for a source of the sound, they could find nothing. There had been no recent anomalies reported or any additional hostile behavior. Instead, whenever it sees a new human, SCP-066 repeats the name Eric again and again in the same deep voice. Who is Eric? No one at the facility knows, or if they do, they have not reported it to any official channels. It is possible that the SCP was once owned by someone named Eric, and perhaps, given the circumstances under which SCP-066 first said the name, Eric attempted to cut the threads of the entity while it was in his care. Unfortunately, there are no official records of how SCP-066 was discovered, or why it was brought to the Foundation in the first place. Its origins remain murky and as mysterious as everything else about it. All that is known is that, whoever Eric is, SCP-066 is determined to find him. Once the SCP's class was changed from safe to Euclid, its containment procedures had to be adjusted. While it was previously kept in a simple room, it is now contained in a tungsten carbide box at its site's high-value item storage facility. Once a month, the box is inspected for damage to its interior. Due to the SCP's tendency to use its appendages to wear down the walls of the box over time, 
If there is any damage, SCP-066 is to be moved to a new box using a robotic arm that performs this transfer in less than three seconds. The Foundation has attempted to place recording devices in the box with the entity in order to monitor its behavior when there are no humans present, but the SCP destroys every recording device placed inside of its containment box, and any attempts to record its behavior when it is not being observed by humans have been unsuccessful. Whatever it's doing when there is no one around, it wants to keep a secret. On the surface, SCP-066 is one of the less frightening finds contained within the walls of the SCP Foundation. It does not have claws or teeth or the ability to cause mass deaths, but it has incredible, unpredictable capabilities and seems very capable of holding a grudge. There is so much that is unknown about it, from its origins, to its form, to its ability to manifest matter from nothing, and there is something deeply unsettling about this SCP's unpredictable behavior and increased hostility towards being observed. We do not know what it has done, and we do not know what it will do next. All we can do is wonder. As we ponder the nature of SCP-066, it does nothing but sit, staring with unblinking eyes, waiting for Eric to come back. Working at the SCP Foundation might just be the most exciting job a person can ask for, and by exciting, we mean that if you work as an SCP field operative, researcher, or mobile task force member, you're much more likely to die a horrific death on the job than, say, a plumber. But at least you get the honor of proudly saying that you're the first line of defense between the normal world and the terrifying domain of the anomalous. Well, unless you're one of the IT guys. Then your work life is likely as tedious and uneventful as the computer tech guy working on the Geek Squad. But nothing is ever normal when it comes to the SCP Foundation, where even the person whose job is helping other staff members reset their email passwords may run into the supernatural. Welcome to the strange and frightening world of Pattern Screamers, and specifically, SCP-000. SCP-000 was first discovered completely on accident by technical researcher David Rosen, a man intrinsically connected to the pattern screamers lurking on the SCP Foundation computer database. Technical researcher Rosen is actually somewhat of a celebrity around the Foundation staff, due to the fact that he's so perfectly mediocre at what he does. His job as the glorified IT guy at the SCP Foundation was previously held by the more qualified researcher Patrick Gephardt, but Rosen was called in to replace him after Gephardt mysteriously disappeared while on the job. Since 2012, Rosen has been Site-19's user-level tech support wizard, but the best thing that can really be said about his job competency is that he's got a 100% attendance record. He seems to live out of his office, which is described as the filthiest at the whole foundation. Every inch of the floor is covered in old, broken computer parts, and the air is stale with dust and the twin odors of sweat and lithium grease. It's a place so inhospitable that the Foundation has seriously considered <laughs> bottling the stench as a kind of chemical deterrent. While Technical Director Rosen isn't good at his job per se, he isn't technically bad enough at it to justify the time and resources it would take to replace him. But the worst part about Rosen isn't his performance, it's his truly rotten attitude. He's universally described by his colleagues as being rude, grumpy, and combative, with patience that's far too short for someone working in tech support. And while Rosen does have a real fear that the ghost of Researcher Gephardt is stalking him, he was about to have his first actual brush with the supernatural. It all started when he began receiving automated repair tickets for SCP-000, a file that had no reason to exist. As any longtime follower of the SCP Foundation will know, the universal designation for the first cluster of SCPs to be discovered is SCP-001. There is no SCP-000. It simply doesn't exist. And when Rosen first found the file lurking on the database, he found that it was filled with worthless nonsense. The object class was recorded as null. The special containment procedures read, Error. Field, containment underscore procedures does not exist. And the mess of a description simply read, Internal system error. Field undefined. Please contact system administrator over and over again, becoming more mangled and nonsensical each time. Technical Director Rosen, who could never resist an opportunity to complain, decided to leave an angry administrator's note on the useless file. 
He claimed that this pile of junk data was sending out pointless repair tickets because of its broken syntax, clogging up the system and preventing him from doing actual work on meaningful files. He assumed that this was all down to the database not knowing how to react to having files logged with insufficient information, and he suppressed all future repair tickets from SCP-000 before declaring the matter over and done with. What the pig-headed technical director didn't realize was that he was suppressing a call for help from an entity trapped in the white space below the article itself. It was a being born into a pure white world of absolute nothingness, an entity with no name and no place, but it was somehow capable of thought. Its panicked inner monologue is readable in the hidden text which takes the form of a rambling stream of consciousness. The being first described coming to life in this empty world with no memories of where it was or even how it got there. It spent what could have been years exploring the empty wasteland, Occasionally, it would see horrific monsters pop up around it, but only for a split second. The entity continued to wander, and little by little, the existential dread mounted, as it realized that it may truly be stuck here in oblivion forever. The entity only had one word to go on, a word repeated by some of the monsters it encountered. Foundation. The entity had no idea what this foundation even was, but it grew to hate and fear it. Was this foundation the one that trapped it here? The entity had all the time in the world to speculate on it. Eventually, the entity found its voice. Like any sentient creature in trouble, it began to call for help, eventually screaming, just hoping someone would notice it. These pleas likely translated into the frequent IT repair tickets, a coded SOS, an attempt to show that everything was not as it appeared on the SCP-000 file. Perhaps the entity may have found help if researcher Gephardt was still working at the Foundation, but instead its cries fell on the ignorant ears of Technical Director Rosen. It may as well have been speaking to a brick wall. Rosen, who had all the investigative zeal of Paul Blart Malkop, made sure that these cries would never lead to the entity's freedom when he suppressed the repair tickets. He had trapped the entity in a private blank hell, forever hating a life it didn't choose and could never escape. A relentless, existential nightmare. This is the gist of your average Pattern Screamer. Pattern Screamers are a perfect example of literally making something out of nothing. They are often a kind of floating consciousness, created from nothing, trapped in pockets of nothingness between the fabric of reality, driven mad by the purgatory-like nature of their existence. They're less living entities and more conceptual constructs, pure ideas, that just happen to be self-aware of their own existence in their private hellish voids. The SCP-00 file, a file for an anomaly that doesn't exist and thus had no reason to exist, is a perfect breeding ground for a pattern screamer. But sadly for the pattern screamer in question, Technical Director Rosen had no idea. This isn't the only time that Rosen had run into a pattern screamer without even knowing either. And just like the first case, he was with no help whatsoever. This one began with SCPS, an otherwise empty file containing only this image. Director Winters, a Foundation administrator, wondered why this file even existed. Enter Technical Director Rosen, filled with equal parts sarcasm and insubordination. He gave a condescending reply to Director Winters, saying that the file was there to test the filing system, and the image was likely just a placeholder. Winters never should have been on the page anyway, according to Rosen. Director Winters was annoyed at Rosen's typically rude tone and asked him to make the purpose of the article clearer in the article itself. In response, Rosen did as he was told, filling the article in the most sarcastic manner possible. The whole thing was essentially a middle finger to Director Winters for having the audacity to even ask. Rosen signed off with, There. Finished. I certainly hope I have been clear enough to anyone who may have accidentally accessed this page, through what I am sure is no fault of their own, so we won't have any more incredibly competent directors bugging the tech team about this page. And once again, technical researcher Rosen was too busy being a rude, unpleasant jerk to notice he was practically staring another pattern screamer in the face. This pattern screamer, or rather, hive of pattern screamers, were trapped even deeper than the one in SCP-000. This one was hidden in the very source code of SCPS, where a chorus of enraged voices screamed the following, Pretend, monster, just for a minute. 
Pretend you were the size of an amoeba, dwarfed by even the smallest of bugs. Pretend you didn't hold the world in a glass cage. Pretend you were the one being held by something greater than yourself. Would you still be laughing at your triumphs? Would you still feel pride in what you were, even as pitifully small as you would be? Of course you would, because you are arrogant and stupid. If you haven't guessed yet, we hate you. This pattern screamer is clearly more aware of its pitiful station in existence than the 000 pattern screamer. And as a result, it's not so much depressed as it is furious. Though at this point, you've probably figured out that even the entities who have the most casual brushes with technical researcher Rosen end up getting infuriated. But while you may have gotten the impression that all pattern screamers are sad little entities worthy of our sympathy and pity, there's at least one pattern screamer that's actually incredibly dangerous. This is SCP-3930, the ultimate pattern screamer, in terms of both size and effect. It's an anomaly so strange it defies typical containment classification, and it bears a level 5 security lock, meaning only those on the level of the legendary O5 Council are cleared to even know about it. Its greatest containment procedure is the preservation of the very idea that SCP-3930 does not exist, because the alternative has terrifying implications for all involved. SCP-3930 is a one-kilometer area in Russia that is filled with non-existence. To even call it a white void would be inaccurate, because it implies the existence of the color white and the existence of the concept of a void. Nothing exists within SCP-3930, and anyone who directly observes 3930 runs the risk of actively increasing its power. That's why special containment procedures dictate that anyone who observes 3930 must be forced to walk into it afterwards, which results in them ceasing to exist. They're destroyed on the deepest level that anything can be destroyed. The very idea of them ceases to be. Another reason that SCP-3930 is so special is that, because it's the largest area of nothing in existence interacting directly with our reality, it's the only place that a huge number of pattern screamers can be directly observed by humans. They're described as being like sentient hallucinations. One researcher suggests that these pattern screamers are created by the way the psyche shatters when brought into contact with raw, true nothingness. The nothingness acts like a hateful mirror to our worst thoughts, reflecting them back at us in the forms of restless screamers. Regardless of what they actually are, one thing is for sure. Coming into direct contact with one of these screamers is a harrowing experience. In the end, it just goes to show that pattern screamers are a complex entity. They can range from microscopic to massive, from pitiful to downright terrifying. And the sad result is that, in either case, nothing can really be done to stop them. It's just as impossible to stop the nothingness existing in SCP-3930 as it is to save the entity trapped in the white spaces of SCP-000. Maybe the best option is to actually be more like Technical Director Rosen. Keep your head down, focus instead on your own petty worries, and bask in the warm bliss that can only come with having no idea what you're dealing with. The one downside is that this may make you a pretty lousy IT guy. There are some things human beings aren't meant to know, and it's the sworn duty of the SCP Foundation to discover and contain such information. But sometimes knowledge is discovered that shakes even the Foundation itself to its very core. One such discovery occurred on April 28, 2016. That night, SCP-2935 made itself known to the Foundation personnel. To this day, the exact nature of SCP-2935 is a mystery that even the Foundation's brightest minds can't completely understand. Everything we know about SCP-2935 today comes from three doomed missions to the anomalous zone's interior. This is the story of those infamous expeditions. The nightmare began around 5 a.m. when SCP Foundation Site 81 in Bloomingdale, Indiana intercepted a distorted radio signal. Communications personnel at the site traced this strange signal back to the unincorporated area of Joppa, Indiana, near U.S. Interstate 70. As is Foundation policy, a team of field agents were dispatched to the location in order to determine what they were dealing with. However, rather than finding anything that could logically produce such a signal, they instead discovered a long abandoned cemetery. The most recent death on any of the tombstones was recorded as being over a hundred years ago, all the way back in 1908. 
On further investigation, the Foundation discovered an unmapped limestone cave opening beneath the cemetery, and when they sent a drone into the depths of the cave, it appeared to quickly exit out the other side of the cave. But something wasn't right. The area that the drone was observing appeared consistent with the landscape from which it entered, but now it looked somehow grayer. It lacked the color of life of the place it just come from. The grass was dead, there were no trees, no shrubs, no animals or birds in the sky. They weren't looking at our world, they were looking at a strange reflection of our world on the other side of the cave. In fact, it wasn't a cave at all, it was a passageway between two dimensions. It was SCP-2935. Just then, they were able to unscramble the distorted transmission they'd been receiving. It went as follows. This is an automated emergency broadcast from the SCP Foundation and your national government. One or more of our sites is experiencing a communication breakdown, likely due to a containment breach of unknown magnitude. All citizens are ordered to stay in their homes as containment teams work to secure the breach. This message will broadcast from April 20th, 2016 until… At that point, the message would cut and repeat, as it had for eight straight days. The message source? Site 81, but not this Site 81. The SCP Foundation was receiving an emergency distress signal from themselves in another dimension, a bizarre event that even the Foundation had never experienced before. Field agents were terrified by the implications of what they just heard and contacted Site 81 Command to request additional units. The Foundation wished to fully understand this anomaly as quickly as possible due to the potential threat it could pose toward the Foundation, so they dispatched Mobile Task Force Epsilon 13, codenamed Manifest Destiny, to perform the first of three manned missions into the heart of the anomalous zone. The first exploratory mission into SCP-2935 was codenamed Gauntlet and consisted of a four-man team fitted with full hazmat suits and direct video and audio links to Mission Command. The team was led by a field operative known only as Agent Juno. His subordinates were Agents Kale, Devon, and Underwood. Their directive was to gather samples and survey the area positioned directly around the insertion point, meaning the other cave mouth of SCP-2935. The mission only lasted about an hour, but what they saw in there would stay with these men for the rest of their lives. After a 15-minute trek through the cave, Manifest Destiny arrived in the Mirror Dimension, where they were struck by the eerie silence of a place that seemed identical and yet so different from their home dimension. The first observation they made was the total absence of all living vegetation. Trees, grass, weeds, everything, it was all dead. On orders from their superiors back in the original dimension, that we'll refer to from here on as Dimension Prime, Manifest Destiny headed deeper into the mirror dimension of SCP-2935. They traveled two kilometers without detecting a single sign of plant or animal life, not even insects. Eventually, they came upon a farmhouse with two cars parked outside. With authorization from command, Manifest Destiny breached the house and headed inside. Agent Kale confirmed that there was still power flowing to the building as the lighting appeared to work just fine, but they came upon a horrifying discovery in the house's dining room. Three adult corpses, two female, one male, were seated at the table. A fourth corpse, that of a male child, was sprawled out on the ground nearby. As if the death of what looked to be an entire family wasn't awful enough, the Manifest Destiny team noticed a number of other alarming details. There were no signs of decomposition on the bodies, nor did there appear to be any obvious cause of death. The family's last meal was still on the table, chicken, mashed potatoes, and green beans. While the food looked cold and stale, there was no evidence of rot or spoiling. The team found an open newspaper dated April 19, 2016, illustrating that the family may have died a full eight days before the discovery. In Dimension Prime, decay would already be very well underway by that point, yet here there wasn't even a smell. Instead, everything was just covered in a thin layer of dust. Command requested that Manifest Destiny collect samples of the food as well as hair, skin, and fluids from the corpses for further study. Small electronics like smartphones were also taken from the bodies. Agent Devon turned on the television in the living room and found that while most stations were now running test signals, the shopping channel was still live. Well, the feed was live at least. Both hosts sat in front of the cameras dead, but perfectly preserved. The date on the screen read April 28, 2016 suggesting that the times of Dimension Prime and Mirror Dimension were exactly the same. In fact, everything seemed the same, the only difference between the two dimensions being that some kind of mysterious apocalyptic event had occurred in the last eight days in SCP-2935's Mirror Dimension, but exactly what had happened or how remained a mystery. When Manifest Destiny exited the farmhouse, they once again remarked on the lack of all signs of life around them. At this point, the team returned to the insertion point of SCP-2935, but were instructed to remain in the mirror dimension while additional units joined them inside. 
Manifest Destiny swelled to 16 members. With the notable addition of Agent Roy as the new commanding field officer, the team split into two groups of eight and Agent Roy and his men infiltrated the Mirror Dimension Site 81 while Agent Juno's detachment attempted to access the base's off-site deep storage servers. This second expedition was codenamed Overland and led the Foundation's field agents even deeper into the terrifying mystery of SCP-2935. Accessing the site was easy for Roy's detachment. It seemed there were relatively few cars on the road at the time of the mysterious extinction event. In the distance, fire still smoldered in the wreckage of planes that looked to have just dropped out of the sky. Agent Roy and his team, like all SCP Foundation personnel, were fitted with vitals trackers, and they assumed that the distress signal that started this whole thing could have been triggered by the deaths of every member of the Foundation at once in the Mirror Universe. Once inside Site 81, they realized that the assumption was probably right. Going door to door in the administrative wing, they found the perfectly preserved corpses of everyone they knew to be stationed there in Dimension Prime, people who were without a doubt still alive in their universe. Samples from the corpses that the Foundation would later study even confirmed the reason that the bodies were perfectly preserved. The corpses had experienced complete and sudden death on a cellular level, and even the bacteria that would typically take part in the decomposition process had died with it. In SCP-2935, death was total and absolute across all types of life forms. As Agent Roy's team ventured further into the bowels of Site-81, they made another unsettling discovery. Their own corpses, in roughly the same spots they'd been inside Dimension Prime Site-81 eight days prior. Some of the Foundation's top scientists, including the esteemed Dr. Bright, were also found dead inside the facility. In an attempt to see just how far this unexplained phenomenon stretched, Agent Roy's team decided to inspect the containment cells, where they found that all the Mirror Universe's SCPs, including SCP-2996, were dead. In his desperation to find some kind of exception to the extinction event, Agent Roy revealed a terrifying secret to the rest of his team. SCP-682, the immortal misanthropic lizard and one of the deadliest creatures known to the SCP Foundation, was contained at this very facility right below them. Could it have something to do with what was going on here? They descended into the containment facility to discover an even more unsettling truth. SCP-682, the unkillable anomaly, floated dead in its tank. Death truly made no exceptions within SCP-2935. Agent Roy's team left the site and rendezvoused with Agent Juno's team to send their research back to Dimension Prime using automated drones. Both teams remained in the Mirror Dimension for another manned operation codenamed 19. They had no idea it would be their final mission. As they descended deeper into the facility, passing more dead SCPs, they discovered one final clue. Based on the activity of the Foundation servers, the event occurred at roughly 3 a.m. While underground in SCP-2935 Site-81, the team accidentally activated the base's on-site nuclear weapon, a failsafe meant to be detonated in the case of an emergency containment breach. Due to the base's failsafe protocols, every member of the Manifest Destiny team was locked and sealed inside Site-81. They, along with everything else, were incinerated in the nuclear blast. Once again, the mirror universe inside of SCP-2935 was lifeless. But that isn't where it ends. When the automated drones returned out of the SCP-2935 cave to the field operations in Dimension Prime, they were in for their own horrifying discovery. None of the footage or information gathered from SCP-2935 illuminated how or why the extinction event occurred. Everyone and everything simply dropped dead at the exact same moment. Nobody was aware, nobody was prepared, death came suddenly and silently, and none were spared. All the Foundation on Dimension Prime were left with was a message from one of the agents from Manifest Destiny, Agent Keller. His final message was, I don't have any answers, I don't think there are any. I'll do this one thing and hope that fixes it. Seal it shut. You've got to lock it in here with us. I'm sorry. The Foundation were at first confused by this until they discovered a final encrypted audio log buried in the files recovered from the Mirror Universe's Site-81. It was a message from Keller himself, but not the Keller from Universe Prime. In this message, Keller described the Foundation in the Mirror Universe, receiving the exact same distorted transmission that they did a few days earlier from a cave in Joppa. When he and the others were dispatched inside, they discovered the same lifeless post-extinction event world that was now so familiar familiar to the Foundation command. But there was a key difference. This wasn't the mirror dimension they'd just been studying, but a third, entirely different dimension. In his haunting final words, Mirror Dimension Keller admits that whatever caused the event in that third dimension, an entity in that Mirror Dimension Keller believed this was the specter of death itself and had followed him back into his world, and history had repeated itself. SCP-2935 was the passageway through which absolute death could pass 
from dimension to dimension, and our dimension was the next in line. The deaths of Manifest Destiny may have saved our entire universe, as anyone passing back through the cave had the potential to bring death itself back with them. The Foundation decided in the end to follow Keller's advice. They sealed the entrance to SCP-2935 with concrete and now kept it under constant watch, since what waits behind the barrier is an entity even they have no power to stop if it ever got through. After all, it had killed them all before, or at least another version of them. What's one more dimension on the pile? Why it may now just seem like a simple slab of concrete under an abandoned cemetery, this is why SCP-2935 might be the most dangerous SCP of all. Please, good sir, I beseech you. As a man of science, nay, as a man of reason, you mustn't stifle my research at this critical juncture. You have no idea how close I am to finding a cure for this blasted pestilence. I need only a handful of live subjects to complete my research." The Plague Doctor's emphatic pleas fell on deaf ears, as a stone-faced researcher took notes on his latest pontifications. The Doctor, whom these clods had reduced so rudely to a mere number, SCP-049, banged his gloved fist up against the wall. And to think he once thought of these men as intellectual equals fellow travelers on the road to scientific enlightenment. What a positively sick joke. Before the doctor got another chance to appeal for his right to experiment, the researcher left him alone once more. A truly sad state of affairs. Nobody appreciated a true scientist in this day and age. It was sure to be another day of languishing alone in this cell, wishing he had the capacity to do more. So he was surprised as anyone when the alarm started going off and the door of his cell swung open automatically. The Plague Doctor stepped out of his cell and into the hall, where many other humanoid anomalies were roaming, confused as to why they'd been suddenly released, what was happening. As it turned out, what was happening was one of the most brutal chaos insurgency raids the staff of Site-19 had ever seen. It had been planned immaculately. You see, guards rotate semi-regularly at Site-19 due to the high-pressure nature of the job. Lots of deaths and mental breakdowns, as you probably correctly predicted. Even the administrative staff of the SCP Foundation are only human. Well, mostly anyway. So they're not immune to little oversights here and there. And it's in those oversights that expertly trained Chaos Insurgency infiltration agents make their living. No less than 15 of them had been working undercover in Site-19 for just over two weeks, and they did a fine job of lowering the metaphorical drawbridge for a heavily armed invasion force. The guards who weren't plants were quickly murdered by the infiltrators, and even some of the on-site task forces were quickly overwhelmed and gunned down by the high-precision rifles of the Chaos Insurgency's finest. While the frontliners were distracted by the sudden assault, the infiltrators found their way to the site's security control room and massacred everyone inside. Opening every single door in the site was as simple as putting in a few stolen key codes and flipping a few carefully remembered switches. Consequently, while Foundation agents and Chaos Insurgency mercenaries clashed sabers, high-priority anomalies like SCP-049 simply wandered the facility, watching the calamity unfold within. The Foundation was beset on all sides, shot at by heavily armed maniacs, and attacked from within by the numerous roaming anomalous entities that were eager to get their hands on Foundation personnel. Definitely not an ideal situation, to say the least. The Plague Doctor only had one thing on his mind, though. Hmm, this definitely won't do my research any good. Unless I can escape and find my way to a suitable laboratory. Oh, now there's an idea. But his scientific fantasies were soon interrupted by a Chaos Insurgency soldier swinging the butt of his M4 carbine into his avian exoskull with a supremely unpleasant crack. The doctor was dazed by it momentarily, the pain coming at him like a thunderclap, but the insurgent never got the chance to take another swing. Before the insurgent could do anything, the plague doctor lunged out with practice speed, grasping him by the throat. Immediately everything went black, and the insurgent's limp corpse collapsed to the ground. Serves him right, the doctor internally mused. Soldiers attacking medics is violating even the most basic rules of gentlemanly warfare. Then another flash of immense pain, as a different rifle butt collided with the back of his head. The doctor fell to one knee, 
feeling dizzy, but before he could retaliate, he felt the two sharp prongs of a cattle prod pressing up against his neck. The sudden rush of electricity surged through his neck, sending his muscles into a wave of involuntary spasms. The insurgents crowding around him chimed in with their own agonizing cattle prods, relentlessly shocking him until the flashes of white-hot pain soon became an oppressive blanket of total dark. Even on his most cantankerous days, the SCP Foundation had never treated him like this. When he eventually came to, he was still in darkness, standing upright, with high-tech shackles holding every limb in place. It was beyond uncomfortable for the poor plague doctor, but it succeeded in the task of keeping him under control. He couldn't move an inch. There were muffled voices beyond the dark, beyond the confines of this new containment. The modulated gas mask voices of insurgents and something else. Faintly accented, oddly familiar, but he couldn't quite place it. Soon the voices were replaced by another sound, the grinding of crowbars levering nails out of cheap wood. With a creaking tumble, a rectangle of bright light opened up in front of him, populated by a number of silhouettes. On either side were Chaos insurgents in familiar tactical garb, and in between them stood a tall, well-groomed man with an expensive-looking purple smoking jacket and a pencil mustache. For a few fractions of a second, his face was a portrait of excitement. But as he took in the sight of the plague doctor standing before him, all the joy drained from his snooty countenance. What the hell am I looking at here? The man in the smoking jacket said. The doctor, indignant at such a response from the man who'd presumably ordered his assault, rasped, A man of science, good sir. The man in the smoking jacket ignored him and continued to berate the Chaos Insurgents with an odd level of confidence for someone reprimanding trained, cold-blooded killers. I wanted SCP-650, the startling statue, not this clownish Ren Faire cosplayer! What the hell did I pay you ruffians for? I was told you Chaos Insurgents were the very best at this, and for your empty price, I expect excellence! The rant continued much like this, leaving everyone in attendance, the insurgents, the plague doctor, feeling thoroughly exhausted by him and unable to do anything about it. You see, this wasn't just any Chaos Insurgency client, your average tin pot dictator or arms dealer, you know the type. This was the one and only Pascal Leggett, one of the most famous or rather infamous Anart collectors in the game. He'd been a founding person of interest for years due to his dealings with the Chaos Insurgency and Marshall Carter and Dark Limited, all to the end of expanding his Anart collection, but his vast wealth and connections had always shielded him from Foundation probes. For those unfamiliar with the subculture, Anart, short for Anomalous Art, is exactly what it sounds like. Artistic projects with anomalous properties to give it that extra kick. One of the most popular groups of interest dealing in Anart is the iconic Are We Cool Yet? which, incidentally, had recently excommunicated Pascal Leggett for being an exceedingly wealthy, uptight square who really didn't represent the Collective's rebellious ethos. And considering his response was to pay the Chaos Insurgency to raid Site-19 for a few pieces for his own private collection, costing him millions of dollars and both groups' many lives, it was safe to say he wasn't taking it well. Look, we got you that other statue and that thing killed four of our best guys, so how about we just call it even? said one of the insurgents. I'm sure you can have fun with Birdbrain here, too. Pascal tutted and reluctantly dismissed the hired guns. Having the Plague Doctor here definitely wasn't ideal, especially considering he wanted to host the ultimate Anart exhibition to put Are We Cool Yet Worthless Somme Nous Devernu Magnifique to shame. But he would make do with what he had. Perhaps he could say that 049 was a commentary on the ever-present nature of disease in mankind's life and our forever archaic approach to it. Yes. Yes, that would do nicely. Needless to say, the Plague Doctor was infuriated by all this. The violence against his person, the kidnapping, the disrespect, and most of all, the interruption to his precious research, especially considering how close he'd gotten to finding a cure for the pestilence. But instead, he was soon spirited by a legion of heavily armed goons from his wooden box to a glass one in one of Leggett's many opulent hallways. There were other glass cases on either side of him, and more on the other side of the hall, all too reinforced for the Plague Doctor to even smash through it on his own. Damn it. Leggett's own private Anart exhibition, probably wedged between his oversized dining room and his jewel-encrusted crapper. Occasionally, Pascal himself would jaunt down the hallway to gaze upon his new stolen Anart pieces, and of course the Plague Doctor would try his best to reason with him. I am a patient man, Monsieur Leggett. 
This is simply barbaric. By what right do you imprison me here? Is your intention to deprive the world, the entire human race, of my valuable medical breakthroughs? Could you live with that on your conscience, good sir? There was never any meaningful response. The plague doctors soon learned that Pascal Leggett didn't like his art interactive. It was simply meant to languish away in a glass box, being watched, being passively looked at. Those chaos insurgency louts hadn't even bothered to bring his notebook or medical bag, so he was without the tools to even perform his experiments. As loathed as he was to admit it, this was even worse than being locked up by the SCP Foundation. But all this wasn't entirely unfamiliar. There was something in the glass box across from the Plague Doctor that he vaguely recognized back from Site-19. He'd never seen it up close, but he'd heard researchers speaking about it, and even seen a few pictures. And such a strange construction it was. A peculiar, haphazard sculpture made from concrete, rebar, and spray paint. Quite ugly, in this humble doctor's opinion, but there was something oddly entrancing about it. And for reasons beyond the doctor's recollection, four of Leggett's men stood around the glass box in where it was being stored, always watching. The men were frequently switched in and out, as though they were watching in shifts, always fixing their gaze on its peculiar, malformed body. Maybe it was all the electrical shocks and knocks to the head, but he just couldn't remember why Pascal was having the piece so carefully observed. But he knew on some primal level that the secret to this would perhaps be the key to his own escape, if only he could remember. Still, time passed. Pascal drifted in and out, sometimes with guests. The plague doctor had learned not to speak. These animals could not be reasoned with. As a scientist, he would instead carefully observe until his observations bore fruit. He noticed that Pascal's guests, all people who looked equally as wealthy and pompous as Pascal himself, all seemed to look right over him, and instead focus on the ugly statue across the hall, still forever observed by any four of Pascal's men. Some of them looked actively nervous, just being in its presence. Curious, the plague doctor made a mental note of this, just as he did when Pascal gave his guests a reassuring pat on the shoulder and told them, Please calm yourself. It's harmless while my personnel are keeping an eye on it. Little by little, the plague doctor's memories of his infamous neighbor had begun to return. He knew what he must do to escape. Now all he needed to do was wait for the perfect moment. Soon enough, Pascal's mansion was filled with a bevy of Anart snobs from hither and yarn, a private soiree to show off his new collection. They wandered the halls in three-piece tuxedos and designer ballroom dresses, sipping champagne from imported crystal. All such lovely, refined, high-society people. And if the good doctor's plan went off, as he intended, they would all be such lovely, refined, high-society corpses. The plague doctor waited until, mercifully, he and the four members of personnel watching the sculpture were the only ones left in the hallway. He'd been so good, so patient, that none of the men guarding the sculpture at present had ever heard him make a noise. He was so invisible to them that, in all likelihood, they probably didn't even notice he could make a sound. And that worked for his purposes just fine. Though in any case, if he wanted this to work, he would need to time his plan perfectly. Even a fraction of a second out of place and the whole thing would have dire consequences. Still, the doctor was still a Frenchman at heart. And as a Frenchman, he knew he would rather die nobly in the process of escape than remain captured by this worthless buffoon. He'd be sure to take as many of these men down with him in the process as he was able. The plague doctor exhaled deeply, drawing a lungful of air, then bellowed as loud as he possibly could. The sudden, unexpected noise was so shocking that it jogged the four watchers almost reflexively to turn and look at him. And in the split second that they did, the plague doctor closed his eyes. In the dark, time seemed to move slower, perhaps due to the doctor's keen focus cultivated over many a century. He listened carefully to the sequence of sounds, glass shattering, four choked gasps in sequence, four brutal crunches, then nanoseconds later, more glass shattering. The plague doctor's eyes snapped open just in time. Just as predicted, the sculpture, being entirely unobserved, had smashed through its glass case murdering all four members of personnel by snapping their necks, and then smashed through his own glass case to do the same to him. The plague doctor had cut it so close, in fact, that he opened his eyes to the face of the sculpture staring into his own, 
its concrete limbs wrapped around his neck. Very good timing indeed. With a sigh of relief, the Plague Doctor slipped out of the sculpture's concrete grasp and back down the hallway, keeping his gaze fixed on the sculpture the entire time. He had heard it decimate Pascal's men. He certainly didn't fancy undergoing the same fate. The second the Plague Doctor backed around the corner, rendering the sculpture, or as the SCP Foundation called it, SCP-173 out of sight, he could hear terrified screaming coming from the other end of the hall. He was not a sadistic man, but the Plague Doctor would be lying if he told you he didn't take just a little bit of pleasure in hearing that sound. Somewhere else in the vast mansion of Pascal Leggett, the sculpture was slaughtering its way through servants and party guests, while the Plague Doctor searched for some kind of exit. Anyone who dared get in his way was given a swift and merciless touch of death, sending their body unceremoniously to the ground. Anyone in his way was preventing him from finding a cure for the pestilence, and thus endangering countless lives. It was, of course, regrettable to have to kill anyone, but some sacrifices must be made for the greater good of mankind. Well, it's not necessarily always regrettable, per se. On his way out while the murderous rampage of SCP-173 seemed to distract anyone of note, the Plague Doctor just so happened to encounter a fleeing Pascal Leggett, hoping to find some kind of escape himself. It seemed that now fate was on his side once more. To have his jailer right here in the palm of his hand would be such a perfect parting gift. Funnily enough, Pascal was far more talkative to him now. He rattled off a rapid-fire series of threats, bribes, and pleas, claiming in the end that he never meant any harm. He was the one who freed the Plague Doctor from the SCP Foundation. They were on the same side here. All this was for the art. No offense was ever intended. Pascal Leggett simply lived for art. Then die for it, good sir, the Plague Doctor said. And with a single touch, Pascal's eyes rolled up into the back of his head, and he fell to the ground, dead. It was one of the few non-scientific deaths that he felt truly no guilt for. After some time searching, the screams around the rest of the mansion eventually went silent. That did wonders for his focus. It didn't take long for the Plague Doctor to locate an exit, a fine mahogany door with elaborate adornments befitting a man as gaudy as Pascal and began strolling towards it, his chest swollen with pride and a sense of accomplishment. Then he blinked, and a few feet in front of him stood the sculpture. It was there so suddenly that the Plague Doctor fell backwards in shock, but he devoted everything to keeping an eye on that monstrosity. With everyone else in the mansion presumably dead at this point, it had now come back for him. It stood there staring silently, ready to exact the terrible price for freeing it as soon as the Doctor dared to blink. The Plague Doctor began crawling backwards down the hall, just wanting to put some distance between himself and the sculpture. As the seconds passed, he could feel his eyes drying out until the inevitable blink. The sculpture was standing right in front of him now, gazing down, almost mocking. It had closed the distance so quickly. If the Plague Doctor blinked again, he was sure that his eyes would never open again. All it had to do was wait as the seconds passed, and the Doctor began to feel his eyes drying up again. That subtle sting quickly grew into a nagging pain that could not be denied. Sooner or later, he was going to have to. Bang! The front door flew open, and in an instant the hallway was filled with heavily armed troops, all wearing the familiar black and gray of the SCP Foundation. The Plague Doctor had never been so relieved to see the organization that had kept him locked up for so many decades. For once, they'd saved him from something even worse. Of course, the sculpture didn't say anything but the disappointment of losing that one more victim seemed to radiate off of it like a lingering bad smell. The Plague Doctor willingly gave himself up, and heavy machinery was brought in to pick up SCP-173, with the help of the iPods to make sure it didn't try any funny business in transit. Pascal had gotten away with his shady dealings for years, but the brazen attack he funded against Site-19 was now enough for the Foundation to track him down. When his corpse was found in the halls of his own home with no obvious cause of death, we can happily tell you that nobody was disappointed. By the evening, the Plague Doctor was happy to be back in his cell. His research could continue here, and in time he knew that the personnel of the SCP Foundation would listen to reason and comply with his demands. After all, science marches on, regardless of who chooses to march with it. But he would forever feel a little nervous in Site-19 after that, knowing the concrete monster he was sharing the building with. He hoped that if ever there was another containment breach involving that… thing, 
that it didn't feel like paying him a visit for old time's sake. The fabric of our world is littered with strange doorways if you know where to look for them. Tears, portals, anomalies, all leading to places and planes beyond human imagining and understanding. An SCP-2317, otherwise known as a door to another world, certainly fits that description. Contained and kept at all times under the watch of armed guards, SCP-2317 appears to be a simple and unsuspecting wooden door in its frame. It hardly looks like it requires such extreme round-the-clock security, or needs a strange, secretive ritual that the Foundation performs, presumably to keep the door closed. But of course, sometimes the most interesting thing about a closed doorway isn't where it leads, it's what it keeps out. Even by the Foundation's already high standards, the requirements and regulations for personnel who are assigned to SCP-2317 seem oddly specific. Psychological testing is standard practice to work for the Foundation, but an additional hurdle that anyone has to clear before even getting to glimpse at this unassuming wooden door is having a score of at least 72 on the Milgram Obedience Examination. It is also mandatory that personnel assigned to maintaining it are both unmarried, with no children or next of kin, as well as an unwavering, unquestioning loyalty to the Foundation, pure devotion to its code and objectives. These may seem like strange requirements. After all, SCP-2317 is just a door, isn't it? Perhaps there's a reason that the Foundation keeps so much of the information about SCP-2317 buried deep under layers upon layers of security, with only the Overseer Council privy to the full details of its strange nature. Knowledge, as they say, is power. But maybe knowing too much about whatever is behind that door can prove deadly. Still, if SCP-2317 is a door to another world, an alternate dimension or parallel reality, it must be safe enough to visit. After all, the Foundation has been sending personnel in there on a regular basis. Daily, in fact. According to the O5 Council, this is done as part of a procedure to maintain active containment of… something lurking beyond that old wooden doorframe. But what could possibly warrant such constant maintenance and surveillance? In accordance with the Foundation's guidelines, all staff are required to rotate out of observing SCP-2317 after every two months, and spend the following third month in full psychological counseling, before they are permitted to return to the containment unit housing the door to another world. It was after one of these month-long periods of evaluation that a Foundation guard was informed that his security clearance has been raised to level 3, and that he'd been selected for the duty of carrying out 220 Calabasas. He knew the name instantly. This was the title given to the daily containment procedure that absolutely had to be carried out. The guard didn't question these orders. After all, he'd been selected precisely because of his loyalty to the Foundation. He did make one request to his commanding officer, however. He wanted to know what had happened to the last guard that had performed the procedure. Didn't make it out of psychological evaluation, the officer replied. Not letting this affect his dedication, the guard was told to prepare for Procedure 220 Calabasas. Along with a fellow member of Foundation security personnel, the guard was instructed to gather everything on a strange list. The first was a pre-selected member of Class D personnel, specifically a convicted murderer. Class D refers to disposable class personnel, expendable individuals recruited by the Foundation for the sole purpose of testing SCPs. Class Ds were usually prison inmates repurposed for SCP testing, and the one chosen for 220 Calabasas was no exception, serving multiple life sentences for murders, or at least that's what the guard had been told. A Foundation personnel member instructed him to refer to the Class Ds solely as the assistant from that point on. Next, the guard collected a live chicken, an obsidian-edged knife, a silver aspergillum and aspersorium, to be filled with 500 cc's of holy water, that have been blessed by a priest of the Abrahamic faith, and finally, a one kiloton nuclear device, which according to instructions, was only to be detonated in the unlikely event of a catastrophic containment failure, in other words, the last resort. After following his instructions to the letter and without question, the guard and his colleague were briefed. The Foundation personnel member informed them that he'd be joining and leading them in the procedure. 
The staff member also specified that henceforth he'd be referred to as the celebrant until the completion of 220 Calabasas. The guard was acutely aware of how specific these instructions were, but trusted in the foundation. Knowing that if they wanted this procedure performed a certain way, then it was in everyone's best interest to carry out the orders to the letter. But what the celebrant then went on to explain raised far more questions about SCP-2317 and the nature of Procedure 220 Calabasas. The Class D joining them wasn't actually a Class D. The assistant, as they were now referred to, was in reality another Foundation staff member with a level 4 security clearance specifically tailored to SCP-2317. Every member of staff entering through SCP-2317 and taking an active role in 22 Calabasas needed to be informed that this assistant was not to be harmed or treated as a member of disposable class. Fighting back the nagging question of why the Foundation would employ this subterfuge, the guard, along with his fellow security officer, the celebrant, and assistant, prepared for their departure through the door to another world at solar noon, when the sun was highest over SCP-2317. Solar noon, chickens, and holy water. This all seemed like an oddly occult combination for the Foundation. As they entered the old wooden door, beyond lay a barren salt plain, stretching out for kilometers in every direction. This alternate dimension, according to the briefing, was designated SCP-2317 Prime. The guard immediately noticed a ring of seven pillars directly ahead of the group as they entered, each of them bearing intricately detailed engravings unlike anything from any era of ancient history. Procedure 220 Calabasas was carried out quickly but carefully, the guard watching as the celebrant and assistant were careful not to miss a step. First, the celebrant scattered holy water into the center of the pillars with the Aspergillum and Aspersorium, looking down at his feet and keeping a steady pace as he stepped counterclockwise around them. The guard watched intently as the celebrant completed his circuit around the pillars and turned to the assistant, anointing his head with holy water. Seven seals, seven rings, seven thrones for the Scarlet King, he said aloud. The assistant, with the obsidian blade in his hand, took the chicken and dispatched it in sacrifice, letting its blood mix with the holy water. He then repeated the celebrant's circuit in the opposite direction, before stepping into the center of the stone pillars. Blood for the old gods, water for the new king, the assistant recited, pouring the remaining mix of blood and holy water over a patch of salt in the middle of the seven pillars. Even though he knew it wasn't his place to question the foundation, as the 220 Calabasas procedure took place, the guard couldn't help but wonder what all this was for. It seemed so… ritualistic, like something deeply religious or even magical. He never bought into all that occult mumbo-jumbo, even while working for the Foundation, but he had learned not to question anything, even the strangest and most inexplicable of sights. Little did he know that beneath his feet, was an ancient and unknowable horror, a beast chained and lying in wait. Contained in a chamber directly underneath the pillars sat an impossibly large creature. Humanoid and obese, its body covered entirely in scales thicker than armor plating. Branch-like horns protruded from its jawless head, pointing up to chains that hung from the seven pillars above. Each one hooked into the entity's back. All but one of the chains was broken, a final withering shackle keeping the devourer of worlds in its underground prison. Ever since 1894 BCE, when Erechian mystics imprisoned it, the devourer has been waiting patiently for its inevitable freedom. It knows, as well as the Foundation, that nothing can be done to prevent the final chain from one day breaking. Even Procedure 220 Calabasas won't keep the creature contained. It's nothing more than a smokescreen, an act designed to create an illusion of active containment and maintain Foundation morale until a permanent solution can be devised to keep SCP-2317 imprisoned. Of course, if the guard had known this, it would have also explained the need for a one kiloton nuclear device as part of this stage ritual. Procedure 220 Calabasas had all the components to trick everyone below the O5 Council. Emulating religious and occult rituals, the increased level of security surrounding the procedure and its purpose. 
and telling staff that any failure to correctly and completely perform the 220 Calabasas procedure will result in an XK class end of the world scenario. All these elements work together to conceal the truth that one day the devourer will escape and lay waste to our dimension. Knowledge is power, and maybe knowing too much truly is deadly. Perhaps if the guard had learned any of this, he'd have understood why his predecessor never made it out of psychological evaluation. Maybe if he had questioned the purpose of Procedure 220 Calabasas, he'd have learned the true nature of SCP-2317 and what that doorway kept out. But he was loyal to the Foundation through and through. As the team finished performing 220 Calabasas and returned through the wooden door, the guard took one last glance over his shoulder at the vast salt plain. The entire dimension was calm, silent, but not peaceful. It was patient. The entity had waited centuries for its time, and now all it would take was the breaking of this seventh and final chain. One day. The door was closed behind the guard as he, the celebrant, the assistant, and his fellow security officers stepped back through. Their work done and, as far as they knew, preventing catastrophe for another day. Only the Foundation higher-ups, the Overseer Council, are aware of the true danger posed by SCP-2317 and its sole inhabitant. Current predictions are that at some point within the next 30 years, the Devourer of Worlds will be freed. Any and all attempts to repair or recreate the chains holding it in place have so far failed. As such, the O5 Council has elected to continue providing Foundation personnel with the ignorant hope that Procedure 220 Calabasas is an effective strategy for containment. As we've said, sometimes the most interesting thing about a closed door isn't where it leads, it's what it keeps out. In the case of SCP-2317, the unassuming wooden door holds at bay an ancient creature of untold power that will one day break free and wreak havoc in our dimension. Nothing the Foundation does can prevent it or keep it contained behind the door to another world. And only the Overseer Council knows that any and all efforts to do so are futile. With all that in mind, we can only hope that the doorway of SCP-2317 stays closed, at least for a little while longer. SCP Foundation agents stationed at Area 37 had intercepted chatter from a normally closed communication system in a nearby city. To anyone else, the calls that the Foundation were eavesdropping would seem innocent, even boring. But the Foundation immediately recognized the coded language being used. They were listening to communications between underground cells of the Serpent's Hand, a dangerous paramilitary organization that stands in opposition to everything the Foundation is trying to do. Once deciphered, the Serpent's Hand messages revealed plans for killing Foundation personnel, breaking into containment sites, and releasing anomalous creatures and objects into the world. Pretty standard stuff for the Foundation's least favorite anomaly-loving insurgents, but they kept using one code that even the Foundation didn't have any intel on. They kept asking about the condition of the sisters. Fate has a funny way of sneaking up on you, though, and in time, they would know more about the powerful, sadistic, reality-warping beings known as the Sisters than they could have possibly imagined. But what they would eventually learn was not the kind of data that anyone would ever want to have. After intercepting clear lines of communication from a local Serpent's Hand cell, triangulating the location of their compound was child's play, and mobile task forces were dispatched from Area 37 with orders to neutralize the potential threat before they could mount an attack on a facility. Just when the Serpent's Hands least expected it, they had heavily armed Foundation soldiers kicking down their doors, crashing through windows and rappelling down from the ceiling. As expected, the Serpent's Hand put up a fight, but thanks to their superior training and the element of surprise, the Foundation's mobile task forces came out on top. They were able to capture 15 members of the group for interrogation, as well as a collection of anomalous objects being stored by the group. Among them were a small wooden loom, an enamel needle, and a glass eye. When the task force obtained these seemingly mundane items, a haunted-looking serpent's hand began laughing wildly. He kept repeating, 
You have no idea what you're getting yourselves into. Nobody knew just how right this man was. Not yet, anyway. Congratulating themselves on a job well done, the mobile task forces hauled their captives and the new anomalous items back to Area 37, a heavily isolated foundation site that specializes in the early containment of anomalous objects for initial observation and study. The objects hadn't displayed any anomalous properties in transit. Maybe the serpent's hand was lying, and these weren't dangerous items at all. Or it was actually just a pile of junk. Either way, they were sent to a foundation researcher on site to conduct preliminary tests. The loom, the needle, and the glass eye were laid out across the table for observation, when suddenly, the attending researcher felt a dark presence looming behind him. He turned, with sweat beating on his brow, and saw three humanoid translucent figures floating in the air behind him. They would soon become known as SCP-1765-1, 2, and 3. The researcher could feel the power emanating from these silhouettes. Reality seemed to bend and shimmer around them, the way heat distorts the air into a mirage. He could tell right away that they were powerful reality warpers. Even in their brief time communicating with the researcher, 1, 2, and 3 displayed both intelligence and unique personalities. 1 was clearly the ringleader, displaying an articulate command of language. 2 displayed a more mischievous side speaking with a cockney accent, and had a tendency towards creepy giggling. Three was the least communicative of them all, preferring to speak in short, simple sentences, often consisting of just single words. Though, of course, actions speak far louder than words, and it didn't take long for the sisters to define themselves with their actions. One told the scared and confused researcher that they'd been observing the SCP Foundation for quite some time, and that they deeply admired the Foundation's adherence to the scientific method. Of course, the researcher wasn't so much flattered by the sisters' statement as they were afraid for their life. They tried to call security for backup, but found that their tongue was withering and turning into a shriveled, blackened husk in their mouth. The sisters didn't like to be interrupted. As the tongueless researchers slowly collapsed in front of them, the sisters explained the purpose of their visit. They wished to assist the Foundation in their quest for knowledge, and as such, they would conduct a number of experiments on their behalf. They would then happily share the resulting data with the Foundation to compare notes. One expressed optimism, saying that she believed they were about to embark on a beautiful scientific relationship. The reality couldn't be further from the truth. The sisters began their work moving rapidly around the facility, bending and twisting reality wherever they went. They circled Area 37, making it separate from the rest of the world it inhabited. Area 37 no longer belonged to planet Earth. It belonged to the sisters. It was their private experimentation lab, filled with live and unwilling guinea pigs. The Foundation attempted to retake the facility by force, sending in Mobile Task Force IOTA-6, also known as the Canvas Cats, into the belly of the beast but they never returned. In addition to changing the fabric of reality itself, they also altered the physical structure of Area 37 to better serve their experimental designs. It was divided into four sections, marked A, B, C, and D, each with their own unique purpose. Section A, which had formerly been Area 37's storekeeping, mess hall, and dormitories, had been the least affected by the sisters' attacks on reality. The biggest alterations were the appearance of two large metal vats situated in the east corner of the mess hall, a monitoring station connected to the other sections of Area 37 that replaced the storekeeping zones, and an imposing marble sign hanging above the dormitories that reads, Control Group, a quick refresher from science class. The control group in an experiment is the group that isn't subjected to the experimental effects the others are, so they can be used as a benchmark to measure against. The same was true here. The prisoners in the control group were the safest of all, but they were forced to do something almost as bad. They had to watch the horrors playing across the rest of the facility. One of the sisters would occasionally return to this section to oversee the feeding of the control subjects, and to encourage them to take part in the observation of their unlucky peers. Section B, which had formerly been Area 37's outer grounds and sports facilities, had been transformed into the center of a localized spatial temporal abnormality. In layman's terms, 
This meant that its size, climate, atmospheric conditions, pressure, and temporal flow were all subject to constant changes based on the whims of Sister No. 1, who oversaw all the experiments performed in Section B. For those unfortunate enough to be trapped in Sector B, SCP-17651 was their god. But she didn't subject them to her whims randomly, no. In her own words, the purpose of Section B was to delve into the effects of repetitive action performed under unusual conditions on the human psyche. For example, one experiment was set up to test the physical and mental fortitude of a researcher, a field agent, and a sanitation worker. The trio were confined in a sports center and ordered to measure the length of every single pipe and the angle at which each connected to others with nothing more than a wrench, a ruler, a brown paper pad, and a ballpoint pen. The task was an arduous one, taking over 10 hours. And as soon as the subjects were done, one restructured the sports center and ordered them to perform the task again. The same happened another 459 times before one finally concluded the experiment, leaving the subjects with broken bodies and minds in the aftermath. Section C, which had previously been the facility's main office block, exhibited a similar level of anomalous activity to Section B except that it was the domain of the more sadistic and mischievous Sister No. 2. Her main area of scientific interest was studying group dynamics and interpersonal relationships during extreme conditions. Very extreme conditions. For one experiment, the office block had been transformed into a kind of football stadium, with the goalposts removed and replaced by concrete bunkers. The two teams were the captured Serpent Hand members and the members of MTF IOTA 6, fresh off their attempt to retake the site. The two groups were forced into a deadly game with incomprehensible rules, including rising platforms and hooded figures throwing fiery projectiles into the crowd, trying to incinerate the players. But victory didn't lead to safety, as the winners of the game were crushed to death with giant metal hammers, just for the fun of it. Two didn't even try to pretend that this act had a valid scientific justification. Section D, which had once been the facility's high-risk containment area, was now the strangest and most mysterious section of all. Under the charge of the equally peculiar and enigmatic Sister No. 3, this area appeared physically unchanged from its state prior to the arrival of the Sisters. Temporally, however, Section D was the most warped of them all. It existed in a kind of temporal bubble, outside of the rest of our reality's timeline, giving Three a frightening amount of control over all that went on in her domain outside of time. There she was performing the most strange and incomprehensible experiment of all. The subject was the former site director at Area 37. He was brought to a table and asked to choose between two different flavors of ice cream that were presented to him. Sounds simple enough. So then why is this the worst of all? Because the site director is caught in a time loop. He's been choosing between various flavors of ice cream for over 10,000 hours, and he doesn't even seem to know. Three's only comment on the matter? Delicious. All attempts to liberate the unfortunate inhabitants of Area 37 have failed miserably. The sisters don't appear to operate on any form of logic or empathy, and thus cannot be reasoned with. With talks having failed and Mobile Task Force IOTA 6's attempt to retake the site ending in disaster, the only solution left was to create a guarded perimeter around the area, using technology like the Scranton Reality Anchor to fight back against any potential escape by the sisters. The sisters are potentially so dangerous that if they ever truly set their minds to leaving, it's considered acceptable to detonate the facility's on-site nuclear warhead in hopes of finally putting a stop to them. In the meantime, the Foundation has built giant external servers for processing the vast quantities of research data the sisters are constantly sending from their horrifying experiments. Sadly for the inhabitants of Area 37, their grim fate continues to this day. The experiments never stop and the subjects of said experiments seem to be condemned to the eternal torment of SCP-1765. In a way, their unwilling sacrifice protects us all, because if ever the sisters were interested in performing experiments on a larger sample size, well, all we can do is hope we end up in the control group. Gamma would never forget the horrific sight of SCP-5967. On the surface, she kept her nerve, cool and collected, her finger ready to squeeze the trigger as her weapon stayed trained on the entity. But deep down, it turned her stomach. After all, how is someone meant to react when they see a thing like that? 
a mess of flesh and eyeballs towering above them, staring back through more retinas than any living creature has. She did not yet know it, but she'd still be seeing that disgusting pillar of musculature and eyes in her nightmares for months to come. And still, it wasn't even the worst part of the incursion. Far worse than seeing the five-meter-tall eyeball totem watching it blink its many lids at her was witnessing what it had done to Alpha. Only moments before, Gamma's commanding officer had been in control of this situation, leading Mobile Task Force Lambda-5 into the Meadowlands of East Rutherford, New Jersey. The mission should have been a simple smash and grab, the same old boring story their team had lived through countless times before. Pick up a high-value target, the leader of yet another cult practicing an anomalous religion, and bring him in for questioning. Gamma never could have expected that things would go this badly. The task force had arrived to discover Caesar Winters, the leader of a sect of Fifths operating in New Jersey. When Lambda-5 discovered him, Winters and his followers, locals who were all members of a group known as the Commune, were standing in a circle around an instance of SCP-5967. Standing at around 5 meters in height, SCP-5967s were piles comprised of mostly musculature and organs that resembled eyeballs, human eyeballs. Despite lacking a mouth, vocal cords, or any other conventional methods of speech, these pillars could still very much communicate verbally. Although they had little to say besides spouting phrases and principles associated with the fifthist ideology. Almost immediately, the plan to capture Winters had gone awry. It was almost like he expected the Foundation to arrive, like he knew they were coming. As the members of MTF Lambda-5 moved in, keeping Winters in their sights, the anomalous cult leader somehow turned the gaze of SCP-5967 onto Alpha. The team's field commander ordered Delta to open fire, taking out Caesar Winters in a single shot, but only for a moment. Another of the commune members kneeled over and began convulsing. A wound formed at the person's neck, and from it emerged Caesar Winter's face. It grew into a full-sized head, replacing that of the commune member, giving Winters a brand new body in moments. On Alpha's orders to stop Winters from hopping to more bodies, Gamma and the others in their team fired on the other cultists. Everyone was terminated. Fifteen seconds was all it took. Then they moved towards SCP-5967, and everything went wrong. The bodies started to convulse violently, as if some unseen hand was shaking them around like ragdolls. Gamma watched as they began to levitate, hoisted by their necks and floating towards the mobile task force. Not one of them knew what to do, keeping their rifles up and trained on the corpses. Each one folded in on itself, becoming compressed masses of muscle embedded with eyes. That was when the team lost Alpha. Something was happening to their leader. She had dropped her weapon and fallen to her knees. Immediately, Gamma moved in to help her commander, trying to pull her back to her feet. But Alpha was resisting, transfixed by SCP-5967. It's her. She is lost deep in the cosmos and is angry with us for not helping her find her way back. She will kill us all. Lest we lie in our brains and see her for who she truly is. Gamma watched as her team leaders rushed towards the pillar of eyes and licked it. The floating orbs of flesh and eyes that had once been people suddenly hurtled towards the members of MTF Lambda-5 at high speed. Gamma dove clear at the vital moment, performing a tactical role and managing to narrowly avoid being struck. Beta wasn't so lucky. Ready to retaliate, Gamma raises a weapon to fire at the floating remains, only to hear Alpha ordering her to stop. She had stopped licking SCP-5967, but whatever influence had compromised the mobile task force leader hadn't relinquished its hold over her. She grinned unnervingly as her eyes rolled back into her head. Don't you hear her voice? She is angry, but I can save you. I can save us. Let me show you, Alpha said before charging at Gamma with her arms outstretched. In seconds before she could defend against her commanding officer, Gamma found herself pounced upon by Alpha. Grabbing a nearby rock, Alpha swung at her head and knocked Gamma's tactical helmet clean off. Pinning her down, possessed by some unknown anomalous entity, Alpha held open Gamma's eyelids and licked 
her eyeball. Gamma screamed in horror as Alpha looked up to the sky and yelled, I can see you! I can see everything now! The case of SCP-5967 is one of the stranger tales within the annals of the SCP Foundation's history. Their investigation that led to the discovery of these five-foot-tall pillars of eyes and muscle originally began with a different intention. The commune had been making waves in Lindhurst, New Jersey, the kind of waves that had caught the SCP Foundation's attention. The two leaders of this apparent cult were Salem Steros and Caesar Winters, both of whom seemed to be able to use SCP-5967s to take control of the local residents' minds. Anyone that they affected could be controlled remotely by either Steros or Winters, with a seemingly unlimited range and no known way of relinquishing their control over an affected person. Amnestic treatments, hypnotherapy, none of the Foundation's usual methods had worked. Undercover Foundation operatives working secretly within the Lindhurst Police Department were the first to discover an instance of SCP-5967 right under their noses. Literally, the pillar of eyeballs seemed to have sprouted up right in the middle of the Lindhurst Police Station. The Foundation sent in containment teams to secure the area and administer amnestics to witnesses. But just how were Steros and Winters causing these monstrous musculature monoliths to appear? Well, the pair operated a radio show together, known as The Reality Sync. The Foundation agents within Lindhurst had been unable to track down exactly where they were broadcasting from. However, after the SCP-5967 instance appeared within the police station, the answer seemed to present itself. During the building's reconstruction, tapes of their radio show were recovered, seeming to suggest that the pair had been utilizing anomalous means to broadcast the reality sync from within the station itself, while keeping themselves concealed. The reality sync was a religious talk show, specifically focused on discussing elements of fifism with the audience and callers who phoned in to Winters and Steros' hidden studio. What exactly is fifism? Well, there's no easy answer to that question, unfortunately. Other anomalous cults and religions at least have a core tenet or belief at their center. Sarcasism is the worship of disease and decay, while mechanites from the Church of the Broken God venerate technology. The beliefs of the Fifth Church are a little more interchangeable, however. They don't really have any defined theology or religious practices. Fifism is often more just a collection of recurring ideas and motifs, the number five, stars, and the belief in an external cosmic god, often a malicious one. In fact, if there is a defining principle of fifism, it's that it's an anomalous way of thinking that it can't really be understood. Practitioners of fifism are concerned primarily with transcending reality as we perceive it. They are highly interested in entities and anomalies that can warp and shape reality, to the extent of even being fearful of such beings. A lot of fifths seek to not only spread their influence to others through any means necessary, including brainwashing, but also hope to transcend humanity to a higher plane of reality, the fifth dimension. There, in theory, a person would cease to be a human being, and wouldn't even really be akin to a god or powerful reality bender. Instead, they would become something more vague, a concept, unable to be fully defined or to exist in reality completely. Fifths follow this goal, presumably with the intention of saving humankind from reality warping anomalies, and they'll use any infectious brainwashing methods at their disposal to bring as many people as they can into their way of thinking. This brings us neatly back to Caesar Winters and Salem Steros' radio show, The Reality Sync. This was the communes, their particular sect of Fifism's, way of spreading what they referred to as the truth. Based on the various fragmented cassette recordings of their show that the SCP Foundation were able to recover, both Steros and Winters believed in a many-armed goddess, referring to it as only she or her. They encouraged their listeners to pray to this entity and let her know that they were loyal to her. During one of their recovered broadcasts, the pair of Fithis hosts were even able to prank call the SCP Foundation itself. One junior researcher Jones was contacted by the two men and ridiculed for his association with the SCP Foundation. But after a few jokes at junior researcher Jones's expense, Steros and Winters began to insidiously implant ideas of fifism in the researcher's head. They referred to this as giving Jones the truth, something they both intended to do for all of their listeners in order to save them. 
When asked what they really meant, Winters and Steros made vague allusions to the truth being an infinite knowledge that only she could bestow. Jones had no idea who she was meant to be. Our guiding light, our creator, Salem described, before adding, the very thoughts that should be infiltrating your head right now? It seemed that through this call, the two hosts had managed to successfully embed their fittest concepts into the mind of junior researcher Jones, and they weren't about to stop there. During another call on their show, both hosts spoke with a Wallington, New Jersey resident named Wendy Ricefield, who was already a self-proclaimed fittest. Steros and Winters talked Wendy through a ritual to learn the truth, involving her drawing sigils on the walls and floor of her home and lighting candles. The phone line picked up wet squelching noises coming from the other side, the splintering of wood, and Wendy screaming for help as she tried to run from her home, only for something to drag her back inside. Eventually, the Foundation made the executive decision to step in and deal with the situation in New Jersey directly. Steros and Winters' operation was getting out of hand. More and more people in the surrounding area were being brainwashed into believing in fittest concepts and compelled to complete bizarre rituals. Sending a team in to apprehend the cult leaders, Foundation personnel discovered Salem Steros and numerous other members of the commune. They had gathered at an instance of SCP-5967 that had manifested in Wallington, the same place that Wendy Ricefield had been from. Steros and his fittest followers were discovered holding hands and standing in a circle around the anomalous pillar of eyeballs, as well as approaching it and licking SCP-5967. The members of the commune were rounded up, and most were sent to be kept in isolation at Site-9. However, Salem Steros was brought to Site-83 for questioning. Junior researcher Umar Hadid conducted an interview as to the exact nature of the goddess Her that Steros and Winters often referred to, and the anomalous rituals the pair had been involved with. Salem was less than cooperative. He demanded to be set free in the interest of saving people by spreading the truth with Caesar. However, he did reveal some key information about her. According to Steros' claims, she was a goddess actively meddling with reality and influencing human actions. He told Hadid that if he killed the junior researcher right there, it would be because she willed it. Sometime before, both Salem and his cult co-leader Caesar had been stargazing in the Meadowlands, a remote field in East Rutherford. That's when they had allegedly heard her voice and being told the truth. This reality-warping goddess was intending to return home, but that way was broken. So according to Steros, she needed their help. This was the reason he and Winters began creating instances of SCP-5967. The eyeball pillars apparently acted as beacons, like a GPS signal allowing her to come back. The pair and the rest of the commune were attempting to prove their loyalty to her, in the hopes that they would potentially be allowed to transcend reality in accordance with the Fithis principle. Salem Steros was remained into SCP Foundation custody and kept detained in a containment suite surrounded by three Scranton reality anchors. Shortly after, the members of MTF Lambda 5 were dispatched, heading to the location Steros had inadvertently revealed during his interrogation. Their mission was to arrest Caesar Winters, who remained at large after the leader of Lambda 5 was compromised. Eventually, Gamma was able to contact the Foundation, who sent a containment team as backup. They secured the surviving MTF operative along with the infected team leader, Alpha, and the instance of SCP-5967 on the scene. Gamma was offered medical treatment and presented with a silver lion badge for her efforts in the field, along with a two-week vacation as a reward. That did little to stop the nightmares, though. She wasn't the same, and neither was Alpha. After two long weeks of psychological screening, and no further hostile or anomalous activity, Alpha was interviewed by junior researcher Hadid. During their discussion, Alpha, real name Cassandra Sandy Danofsky, described that she could still hear voices in her head, rambling about the truth, fithism, and eyeballs. Amnestic treatment wasn't helping. Suddenly, someone within the Foundation played a clip of Caesar Winters' voice over the facility speakers, taken from one of his and Steros' radio broadcasts. It triggered an instant paranoid reaction from Sandy, followed by her opening her mouth and revealing something growing inside. Another eyeball. Some kind of post-hypnotic suggestion or other form of brainwashing had affected her, and she began exhibiting anomalous behavior. Tell me, Hadid, are you a fittest now? 
She asked the junior researcher, Are you ready to see the truth? Hadid rushed out of the room, shutting the door behind him. Pacing around the room, Sandy started drawing strange sigils of unknown origin on the floor and walls, lighting a candle through anomalous means. Then there came a bright flash of light as a four-legged entity appeared and attacked Alpha. The two merged, causing her body to change until it was unrecognizable. Well, as human anyway. Standing in the interrogation room where Sandy had been standing was a contorted mass of flesh and muscle, with multiple eyeballs staring out from it. She had turned into another instance of SCP-5967. They all had. They were people. Steros and Winters had made beacons out of living people. It happened in 1981, in a small rural village in West Germany. Siegfried Geis, nine years old, ran across the bitter snow, tears freezing to his cheeks. It was Christmas Day, and not long ago he'd been so happy. He was celebrating with his family, his mother, his father, and his young sister, the centers of his universe, when that monster had attacked and destroyed everything he'd ever known. The White Terror, the Destroyer of Christmas Cheer, the Yule Man, SCP-4666. Though, of course, young Siegfried had no idea. In hindsight, Siegfried's parents had been noticing strange things in the lead-up to Christmas Day. Unfamiliar bumps and knocks. Strange smells coming from the attic. The occasional tall, dark silhouette on the horizon outside their isolated old farmhouse. But in all the hustle and bustle of the season, nobody really paid the proper attention to all the signs of an incoming Hoisnacht event. Every eerie feeling was just written off as stress or overactive imaginations. None of the Geis family knew about the true danger they were facing until they woke up to see the Yule Man standing over them, sharpening a rusty blade and staring at them with hungry, sadistic eyes. Merry Christmas. The creature rasped and chuckled. Siegfried was lucky to escape alive, but of course he would never see his family again. He'd be picked up a day or so later, traumatized, catatonic, and almost frozen to death. When he was finally able to speak again, he spoke of a monster having killed his family. When the police investigated his home and found the remains, they deemed it to be the work of an all-too-human serial killer, and poor Siegfried Geis was entered into the foster system. Years of work with psychiatric professionals tried to convince young Siegfried that the monster he claimed to see the unnaturally tall, gnarled, bony freak with those shimmering black eyes was merely a product of his trauma. But he knew the truth. He always knew. What he encountered that day, the thing that took his family, was nothing less than a true monster. And at nine years old, Siegfried made a vow he would one day kill the monster, no matter what it took. When Siegfried was finally adopted and returned to school, he did everything he could to apply himself academically. He had no interest in friends or romantic relationships, even as he grew into his teenage years. The only thing that drew his interest, in addition to the perfection of his academic life, was his own private research into the supernatural. He became an expert in all things occultic and anomalous, sightings of ghosts, phantoms, aliens, and monsters. He wanted to know it all. No, needed to know it all. He would arm himself with knowledge, wanting to know everything he could in advance of the confrontation that would be his final destiny. He also began obsessively researching attacks similar to the ones that killed his family, and found an eerie pattern seemingly to unfold all over the Northern Hemisphere. During the 12 days of Christmas, entire families would be found dead in their homes, mutilated horrifically often with children having gone completely missing. They happened far enough apart in terms of time and space that no connection was drawn between the events, all just random attacks according to the police and media. Weren't the connections obvious? He didn't understand it. It was almost like there was some kind of sweeping cover-up obscuring the true culprit behind all these killings, the same beast that destroyed his life. As Siegfried, now known to most as Dr. Geis, ascended through his time at university, he became one of Germany's foremost scholars on the occult, with several published papers and books that drew fascination of fellow experts and laymen alike. But most importantly of all, 
Siegfried's work got the attention of the SCP Foundation. They reached out to the ambitious rising star of the paranormal world and offered him a research position. Dr. Guise was elated and said that he would happily take the role if they answered one question for him. Did they know anything about a horrific humanoid monster that attacked families across the Northern Hemisphere around Christmas time? This was the moment when Dr. Siegfried Guise, after decades of searching, finally came to know about SCP-4666. He had access to all of the SCP Foundation's information on the monster, putting him several steps closer to what had always been his ultimate goal, killing that godforsaken thing. But this would be easier said than done. After all, if the Yule Man was easy to track, the Foundation would have captured and contained him long before now. His attacks could occur anywhere across the Northern Hemisphere, making catching him the world's largest game of whack-a-mole. But this was a game that Dr. Guys had more than enough patience to play. Over the following years, Dr. Guys worked as hard as humanly possible, not just at the case of SCP-4666, but at every piece of work the Foundation had to offer him. Much like his ruined childhood, Guys made no effort to interact, no effort to form social connections. He just worked and worked and worked and worked with single-minded passion, soon developing a reputation as one of the most hard-working and dependable figures in the SCP Foundation's European division. It was this kind of work ethic that soon saw him promoted to senior researcher and then a site director. He had more control over information, resources, and manpower than ever before. It was almost time. He could sense it. Delegating other tasks to his subordinates, Dr. Guise began to work on his masterpiece, an advanced algorithm connecting police, social media, and surveillance databases across the Northern Hemisphere. You see, while Dr. Guise had never faltered in his quest, neither had the Yule Man. Every year, more families disappeared or were horrifically murdered, and every death weighed on Guy's. He saw them as a personal failing of his, of his inability to fulfill his destiny. But the Yule Man was a creature of habit, and it would be that very adherence to habit that Guy's used to destroy it. Using the algorithm he created, they would perfectly track and triangulate the home most likely to be the subject of a dreaded Huisnacht event, with greater accuracy and precision than ever before. The year was 2022. Dr. Geis was convinced that this time, he would be the one to claim victory and vengeance. There was one thing he didn't tell his Foundation compatriots, though. As he put the pieces in place for the final showdown, he had no intention of containing the Yule Man. This time, he would destroy it. Using his newfound influence as a well-respected site director, he requested the transfer of a few high-profile anomalies, as well as the services of a crack mobile task force death squad. It was time. The Yule Man watched the house from a distance. He'd been observing for days, watching the nice, happy family within. What pleasure it would bring him to destroy them and take what's left to his workshop for further fun. Tonight would be the night that he claimed them. They were all blissfully unaware, and lived in an isolated rural area where nobody but him would hear all the wonderful screaming. The second the lights went out inside the house, he would strike, and bring about some Christmas fear. When the last window went dark, the Yule Man drew a long, rusty blade out of his bag of tricks and approached the house. He crept in through one of the windows. Locks had never been a problem for him. This whole process had played out hundreds of times. He barely even needed to think about it now. He crept in past the presents around the Christmas tree, found the stairs, and began to climb. He'd find them in their beds, one by one, and take his time, savoring the pain, savoring the fear. He went into the youngest one's bedroom first. His lips pulled back into a manic grin. There was the little boy, tucked in under his quilt, like a present waiting to be unwrapped. He grabbed the sheet with his long, gnarled fingers and pulled it back, only to see a plastic dummy underneath, with a stun grenade fixed to its chest. Before the Yule Man could even react, the stun grenade exploded into his face, blinding him with a sudden white light and ringing in his ancient ears. The next thing he heard was a rugged military voice yelling, Squad Alpha, move in! 
Seconds later, the upstairs landing was filled with mobile task force operatives with assault rifles. They aimed and opened fire into the Yule Man, peppering him with painful bullets. He wasn't used to his victims fighting back like this. Truthfully, it even caught him off guard. But sadly for those brave task force operatives, it would not be enough to kill him. The Yule Man gripped his rusty knife and lunged at Squad Alpha. Moments later, they were all dead, and the furious Yule Man was trudging back down the stairs. There had been no satisfaction in this slaughter. How had they caught him like this? Perhaps he'd go eat some of his servants in his workshop to make himself feel better. As he walked back across the living room, past the Christmas tree, past all the presents, the television flickered into life. Staring at him from the screen was the grinning face of Dr. Siegfried Geis, now 50 years old. And the most insane part was that the Yule Man somehow recognized him, the one who got away. 41 years prior. Hello, old friend. You're looking a little glum, Siegfried said on the screen. I take it that you did not enjoy the surprise party I just threw for you. Don't worry, the night isn't over yet. After all, you haven't even opened your presents. With that, the presents under the tree, which were actually packed with C4 plastic explosives, detonated, leveling the entire house with the Yule Man still inside. The explosion could be heard for miles as a great pillar of smoke rose up into the air. Several hundred meters away, Dr. Siegfried Geis waited and watched, flanked by Foundation agents and more mobile task force soldiers taking in the majesty of the explosion. Dr. Geis remained steely-eyed and watched the blaze. Somehow he knew that even that would not be enough to end the monster permanently. He nodded to the lieutenant he'd brought with him. Squad out! Squad Bravo! Time to engage! The man barked in response. The remaining agents and MTF operatives, armed with assault rifles and submachine guns, descended on the burning wreckage of the house. Moments later, a tall, dark figure, the Yule Man, injured but alive, crawled out of the blaze. Immediately, the team opened fire, giving the monster everything they had. But once again, everything was not enough. The creature pulled out two long, rusty knives and leaped into the fray, making short work of the Foundation brass. Soon enough, it stood alone on bloodstained snow, until it caught another bullet in the head. Dr. Siegfried Geis was standing there, the last one alive to face the Yule Man, leveling a revolver. The Yule Man scowled. Geis held his steely gaze. We meet again at long last, Siegfried said. You killed my family. You've killed so many others. Tonight, it is your turn, Yule Man. This is your Wisnacht. Guys opened fire as the Yule Man charged towards him, taking each shot in stride. Even as the Yule Man closed the distance, Guys didn't flinch. His resolve was steely. It made the Yule Man feel confused and furious that he didn't detect an ounce of fear in this man. Even when he drove a knife into the psych director's stomach, Siegfried dropped to his knees and collapsed as the Yule Man ripped the knife back out. His gun clattered to the ground. It had been a mortal blow, and still, he seemed unfazed. Why aren't you afraid? The Yule Man growled. Siegfried spat blood and said, You took my family 41 years ago. Everything since then has just been killing time until I got to see them again. Where you're going, all you'll ever see are flames and torment. The Yule Man, furious, stabbed Siegfried again, this time through the heart. The doctor was dying, his life's work having seemingly amounted to nothing. But with the last of his strength, he reached into his coat and pulled out something, a little gift he'd requested from one Dr. Alto Clef before putting his plan into action. Dr. Siegfried Geis lifted a photo of SCP-096 right in front of the Yule Man's eyes. Merry Christmas! he said with his last breath. The Yule Man was confused. A photograph? Was that it? Was that really this foolish little boy's trump card after all this time? What a waste. Then, without a moment's warning, SCP-096 barreled into the Yule Man, sending them both rolling across the snow. One of Siegfried's preparations was to have SCP-096's containment cube temporarily relocated to only a mile away from the ambush site to avoid collateral damage. If everything else failed, then SCP-096 would be their Hail Mary Pass, their finishing move. And it worked marvelously. 
As strong and evil as the Yule Man was, he'd been weakened by the night's battle, and the Shy Guy was an order of magnitude more powerful than his sadistic foe. The Yule Man screamed in horror as SCP-096 set upon him with claws and teeth. After hundreds of years inflicting it on others, the Yule Man had died in terror, and Dr. Siegfried Guys had died with a smile on his face. Norse mythology tells the story of Jormungandr, a great serpent so long that it wraps itself the entire way around Midgard and bites its own tail. Legend says that when Jormungandr unclasps its jaws and starts to unfurl, it will signal the beginning of Ragnarok, the destruction of the world. And that was about as much information as the Foundation gave to Agent Nielsen when they assigned him to his watch duty in Greenland. In the frozen tundra all day every day, he had been equipped with a sniper rifle, thermal goggles, and put up high in a watchtower. If he saw anyone, anyone, he had to shoot on sight, no questions asked. Whether it was his squad mates, the Brigadier General, or even his own mother, if anyone walked across the barren stretch of ice ahead of him, he was to shoot them dead. Under no circumstances was anyone allowed to enter that cave. The fate of the world could depend on it. But it was cold, and the days were long. For months he'd been sitting there by himself without seeing a single soul walk across the glacier. That's why it took him so long to spy the figure stumbling across the ice half a kilometer away. But the person didn't look any clearer when Agent Nielsen took a look through his thermal binoculars. Barely registering as much warmer than the snow around him, the man stumbled forward, seemingly unaware of the world around him. Could this be the start of the swan song of the world? Is this what he had been warned about? Without a moment's hesitation, Agent Nielsen snatched up the sniper rifle and readied his sights on the man. Somewhere buried deep beneath the Greenland ice is one of the most dangerous SCPs that the Foundation has ever come across. To say that SCP-722's reawakening could spell the destruction of human civilization is no idle concern. Classified as a Keter-level SCP, SCP-722 has been nicknamed Jormungandr, after the Norse myth. Researchers speculate that the creature's existence could in some way be linked to the early origins of the story of the Norse creature. 722 was brought to the Foundation's attention relatively recently. Environmental activist group Greenpeace was shooting a documentary on the effects of global warming on glaciers in Greenland. A small crew, including a director, producer, three camera operators, and a sound recordist, headed out to get some close-up footage from amongst the glaciers. Walking from ice sheet to ice sheet, they noticed several rounded entrances to what looked like deep ice caves. Surmising that these openings were only accessible to them because of the melting glacier ice, the crew climbed down into the caves to get some never-before-seen footage. Some of the footage of their exploration has been recovered since, and in the background of several shots as they are adjusting exposure and pulling focus, you can hear the producer and director theorizing about where these caves have come from. They initially seem to think that the caves are millennia old, preserved by sub-zero temperatures, but soon they come across several markings on the walls, ancient hieroglyphs and symbols. None of the crew were language experts, and so in the footage you can hear them struggling to identify which people group would have carved those into the ice walls. In the decades since, language experts from around the world have studied these markings on those walls, and have still been unable to identify any discernible links to any known human script. Most agree that it does seem to predate the settlement of the island by Eric the Red at the start of the 11th century. During this period, it is believed that there were no human settlements on the island, so the origins of this script remain unknown. As the footage goes on, you may start to notice something that the Greenpeace crew does not. One of the ice walls is no longer a wall at all. It looks like a rock in some of the footage, but whenever a flashlight shines on its surface, you can see a pattern to it. Scales. Then an opening at the far side of the tunnel, the crew emerges into an enormous cavern, estimated to be upwards of 200 meters in height and several times wider. Even their powerful flashlights struggle to cut through the darkness inside. That's the point that the sound recordist notices the scales running alongside them. As the camera pans, you see that they have been walking alongside a tail, several times taller than them. A tail that snakes its way through the darkness of the cavern to meet a hulking mass at the other side, shrouded in darkness. That is where the footage cuts off. Those Greenpeace filmmakers were next seen in a local town that evening. 
None of them had the chance to extol the wonders of what they'd encountered that day, as they were all sick. A couple went straight to bed in their lodgings, complaining of intense headaches and exhaustion. Others tried to check themselves into the ER, but never made it. Each of the crew died of different causes. Necrosis of the skin, internal bleeding, kidney failure. By 9 p.m. that day, all of them were dead. Fortunately, there just so happened to be a low-level Foundation agent staying in the same guest house as them who heard the commotion. Within two days, a perimeter was established. Within two years, the Foundation gained the bulk of knowledge of this SCP that they rely on to this day. It is unknown exactly how large SCP-722 actually is. A hulking serpent, half buried in ice, much of its body cannot be observed. It sleeps coiled up in the middle of the cavern that the filmmakers happened across. Some of its body is buried beneath fallen-in parts of the caves, others frozen into the ground around it. However, based on what can be observed of this SCP, it is estimated to be in the ranges of 8 to 12 kilometers from head to tail. Fortunately for just about everyone, including you, this SCP appears to be dormant. At no time since its discovery has this SCP been observed to move, make a sound, or otherwise indicate consciousness. Sensors are installed in the chamber to monitor its life functions and study its heart rate, temperature, brain activity, and more. One concern to the Foundation is that since its discovery, 722 has had a 0.9% uptick in neural activity. Researchers hope that this is just a natural part of the sleep cycle and that it will return to a deeper slumber soon. That is the hope, at least. So what makes this SCP so dangerous, then, if it's sound asleep? Well, let's go back to Agent Nielsen staring through the scope of his rifle. The barrel kicked back, a puff of warm smoke there and gone in cold air. He watched just long enough to confirm the kill before radioing back to command what he had observed. Within an hour, the cleanup crew arrived. Riding on snowmobiles, they waited at a distance for an hour before approaching the body. Rather unceremoniously, they wrapped it up in a black plastic bag, strapped it to the back of their snowmobile, and took it away for cremation. Nielsen just sat there in his watchtower the whole time, observing it all. The person looked sick, and not the kind of sick that you'd get from spending too much time out there on the ice. Their skin had gone rotten, like they had gangrene or leprosy. It wasn't just your usual frostbite. Most concerning, they'd been wearing a jumpsuit, standard issue for D-Class personnel. Only a vial held in their cold, dead fingers was any kind of clue for Nielsen as to what had been going on in that cave. But that was as close as the agent ever came to understanding the mysteries of SCP-722. The vial, however, was in many ways all he needed to know. That is because contained in that vial was a sample of the liquid secreted by 722. It is a liquid that the Greenpeace crew came into close contact with when they found the creature, and it's a liquid that promises and denies great power and great risk to the Foundation. Any and all attempts to study this liquid in any meaningful sense have failed. Anyone who comes into contact with it will immediately suffer acute sickness. Interestingly, however, there seems to be little consistency as to how this sickness manifests itself. Some develop a number of cancerous cells, whilst others lose cognitive function due to brain swelling. Symptoms seem to vary from person to person. Naturally, this makes studying the substance very difficult. Hazardous material suits have been deployed for researchers attempting to study it, but have all failed, despite being otherwise effective against chemical, biological, and radioactive threats. How the substance is able to infect them is unknown. Sadly, a good number of scientists had to die to make this discovery. Another route of study is to take the substance out of the cave and observe it under laboratory conditions. This was what Agent Nielsen observed as he shot and killed the D-Class personnel emerging from the cave. The D-Class had been sent in to retrieve the vial of the substance for external study. While a safe and direct route of entry and exit had been planned for the man to take, he became critically ill whilst in contact with 722 and developed an aggressive fever. No longer coherent over the radio, he dropped out of signal, wandering through the tunnels for two hours until emerging out of an exit high up on the glacier. Two agents with higher security clearance were dispatched to deal with the body. The reason for their wait was for their own safety. 722's toxin appears to denature with time away from its source, causing it to weaken in potency. If they had approached immediately, they may have well suffered similar fates to the D-Class. 
They survived, but the sample was ruined. All subsequent attempts have also been met with failure. It seems almost impossible to capture a clean sample and transport it any kind of distance. With this toxin, the Foundation would have possession of an immense biological weapon, akin to the discovery of the atom bomb. But as of right now, all it's good for is killing D-Class personnel. Initially, the Foundation believed the fluid to be a defense mechanism for the SCP, something to protect it in its deep sleep. But the more time is spent observing it, the more time this perception is shifting. SCP-722's toxin appears instead to be a weapon. As such, the containment of this creature is of paramount importance. There are eight known access points into the tunnel network that would grant access to SCP-722. Each of them has been sealed with reinforced gates with additional layers of soundproofing. At regular four-hour intervals, nitrogen gas cooled to a near-liquid state is to be pumped through these doors without fail. It is believed that the creature is a form of proto-reptile, and so is theoretically cold-blooded. Its internal temperature is dictated by its surroundings. Therefore, by keeping a cool average temperature in these caves, it is thought that this SCP's slumber can be prolonged. How long is unclear. With rising global temperatures year after year, the threat that the Greenpeace activists were proclaiming is very real. Just perhaps not quite in the way they'd envisioned. Not only would there be an increase in natural disasters and a decrease in biodiversity, there would also be a 12-kilometer snake roaming around the planet, killing anyone in its path. Not ideal. As such, the Foundation has also planted a number of highly skilled individuals in prominent environmental positions in the hopes of turning the tide of global warming sooner. Should the ice in that cave system warm by even a couple of degrees, who knows what kind of spike they might see on the neural monitors. This SCP naturally is buried deep beneath layers and layers of security clearances too. Only in exceptional circumstances and for vital maintenance is anyone allowed to approach this SCP. A minimum of two level 3 clearance agents are required to sign off on any such works. In recent years, a new Brigadier General took charge of the containment operations of SCP-722 after his predecessor was stripped of his duties. Overly zealous experiments and increasingly desperate attempts to harvest or synthesize the 722 toxin saw an alarming uptick in neural activity. Over 40 D-Class personnel were processed and disposed of within a two-week period in an attempt to assemble a micro-laboratory within the main chamber itself. This project failed and the noises of construction threatened the peace that had so long been maintained beneath the glacier. The new Brigadier General is taking no such risks, enforcing a zero-tolerance policy on anyone approaching Site-103 unless suitably cleared. A number of hikers have sadly had to be killed this way, but the Foundation believes it to be a necessary sacrifice to keep the peace. It is quite easy to find a convincing backstory for their untimely deaths and the lack of bodies to bury, just another person to get lost and fall down a crack in the glacier, warning stories that are shared and planted in local towns and on the internet. The only threat to this current piece is a new avenue of inquiry that researchers have stumbled across, a link to a group of animals found halfway around the world. Monitor lizards of the genus Varanus seem to share a similar set of traits to SCP-722, namely the nature of their toxins. You may be familiar with the bite of a Komodo dragon. While the initial wound sure does hurt, the real damage comes in the following hours and days as necrosis sets in from the toxins in its mouth. Could these creatures share a common ancestor? Could 722 be the common ancestor? As of right now, it is just a hunch, but it's one that has taken root amongst the research staff. In order to find out more, though, they need samples, tissue samples, taken straight from the SCP itself. The only way to do back is to go back into the caves and start cutting. If a bit of construction noise was enough to raise brain activity by 0.9%, taking a hunk of flesh could prove a whole lot more dangerous, not least for the personnel involved, who will all have to sacrifice their lives. The potential benefits could be huge. A way to study fatal diseases in a new light, perhaps finding a way to reverse engineer cures to some of the deadliest conditions on the planet, or perhaps the missing ingredient to synthesizing the most powerful biological weapon in human history. Maybe worst of all, it could all trigger the reawakening. Do you remember how the story of Jormungandr ends? With a prediction that when the Great Serpent uncoils, the end of the world, Ragnarok itself, will arrive.
But that's just an old fairy tale, right? The helicopter lurched and rumbled as it made its descent through the Verkoyaninsk mountain range. Conditions were harsh, with fierce winds ripping through the valleys. At any point, a blizzard threatened to strike. Just about managing to touch down, Mobile Task Force Lambda 9 was glad to be out of the vehicle, even if it meant stepping into knee-deep snow. There were eight operatives in total. Early reconnaissance suggested that they were the only people present within a five-kilometer radius, at least. That's certainly what they hoped. L9 operatives 1 through 6 all made their way up through the mountain pass, leaving 7 and 8 guarding the chopper. This was a simple reconnaissance mission. They would need to search the bunker for any signs of life, gather intel, and get out, hopefully before the snowstorm hit. All eight of them were kitted out with the Foundation's Keter-grade cutting-edge anti-psionic plating. The operatives had all been chosen carefully, with L9-1 the leader, being an experienced soldier, serving 11 years in the unit. He had capable psionic powers himself, and approached L9-2, who showed some of the same gifts. All of a sudden, as the group rounded the final pass and caught sight of the facility, both 1 and 2 experienced severe migraines. Battered by the Russian wind, they had no choice but to get to the bunker as fast as possible. It looked relatively unassuming, a small concrete slab sitting amongst the mountains. The six of them gathered around on either side of the doors as number three forced his way inside. Following standard breaching maneuvers, the rest of the team followed suit, charging in through the open doorway and immediately tipping forward into an abyss. They all landed hard side by side on the slope, some of them rolling down, clattering against each other and eventually skidding to a stop. Very gingerly, the group started to get back to their feet and catch their breath as the wind had been knocked out out of all of them. They weren't in a research facility at all. The Soviet concrete walls they'd been expecting, the old computers and the lab equipment were all missing. Instead, they were standing in a void, infinite and white, with no seeming end in any direction. Beneath their feet and curling up above them was an enormous double helix, a rainbow of colors weaving in and out of one another. It was like they had found themselves standing on an enormous strand of DNA. Floating all around them were glowing orbs of light. None of them could tell how near or far these orbs were. They could have been close enough to reach out and touch, or they could have been on the other side of the universe. And slowly, one by one, they noticed the doorway that they had come in through. It was perpendicular to the double helix and floating about three meters above their heads. Through it, they could see the snowy Russian mountains, their only chance of escape. Four murmured something about needing to leave. One argued back at him. They had no idea whether that door was real or an illusion. They had no idea if they would even be able to pass through it. Besides, it was three meters above their heads and floating out over the void, it was risky. But four didn't care much about receiving permission. Taking a few steps back further down the double helix to get a good run-up, he braced himself and sprinted as fast as he could before jumping and reaching for the open doorway. It was as if gravity was suddenly much stronger. As soon as he stepped off the double helix, Four was wrenched downwards, tumbling and spinning, accelerating faster and faster. He let out a petrified scream that sent the other operatives cowering. There was no bottom, at least not as far as they could see or hear. Four's body just got smaller and smaller and his screams quieter and quieter for several minutes until the agents couldn't hear him anymore. And yet inside the heads of one and two, the psionic members of the group, that screaming sound only seemed to grow louder. December 25th, 1962. A man walked briskly through the West Berlin train station. He'd shaved his head the night before and trimmed his beard down to a thick mustache. Dark sunglasses covered his eyes and a fedora was tipped forward. He hoped that his limp was convincing as he shuffled his way through the crowds. One advantage of wearing dark sunglasses in the middle of winter was that he could constantly scan the faces of those around him, looking for anybody who looked Russian. His train had been delayed. An hour outside of Berlin, the train had ground to a halt. German police officers had walked the length of the carriages, checking everyone's tickets and passports. It felt like an eternity. The man was too old by this point to attempt to run away. Besides, running through rural Germany in the snow didn't sound like the best plan. 
So he stuck to his cover story and hoped against hope that the fake passport he bought would be convincing enough. Fortunately for him, the officer checked it. He looked to be about 18 years old. The man doubted that the boy would know a Russian passport if it was signed by Nikita Khrushchev himself. But shuffling through the station, his feeling of unease grew. Russian deserters had been poisoned all around him for the prior 15 years. A number of his own colleagues had mysteriously gone missing after feeling disenfranchised by the Soviet agenda. He was such a high-profile target that there was no way the KGB wasn't actively hunting him down at that very moment. He clutched the briefcase tightly and made his way out of the station. His plan had been to call a taxi, but now the prospect of being alone in an anonymous vehicle with only one other person terrified him. His best protection would be to stay out in the open as much as possible. He would walk to the British Embassy, or rather, he'd pretend to limp there. Lambda 9 operatives number 7 and 8 stood by the helicopter shivering. Their team had been missing for hours now, and they could see the blizzard slowly covering the mountain range like a blanket. Before long, it would reach them. If their helicopter got buried by anything more than a couple of inches, all hopes of evacuating back to base would be dashed. As soon as their team had gone through the doors into the facility, all radio contact with them had been cut off. The Foundation had suspected that the bunker would be heavily insulated, but if that were the case, surely one of them would have stepped outside to resume radio contact and report what they had found so far. Then, all of a sudden, Seven went limp. He remained standing, but his head and shoulders slumped forward as if he'd fallen asleep. Perhaps he had been standing out here for too long. Eight was about to rouse him when suddenly Seven started talking. Hello? Eight, can you hear me? It's one, are you there? The conversation moved quickly. Somehow, one had been able to reach out to Seven's mind and temporarily take control in order to use him as a mouthpiece to communicate with the Foundation over the radio. This kind of contact would normally have been well beyond what one would have been capable of, but he explained that as soon as they had entered the facility, both he and Two had felt their powers growing immeasurably. The Foundation asked for a situation report, and one updated them about what had happened to Four. Trying to escape through the door, he jumped and fell through the abyss. But what was more sickening was that they had seen Four again. All of a sudden, they had started to hear his screams physically, not psionically, and he had fallen past them just off to their right, almost within touching distance. Having decided that it was too risky to attempt an escape as Four had done, the group of them made the decision to travel further down into the facility, descending along the helix. For the next three hours, Seven is unresponsive. He stands there limp in the snow, hunched forward and not speaking, despite Eight and the Foundation's best attempts to wake him. Command, we found something. The helix branches off a bit. There's a doorway there. I can see inside. It looks like a lab of some kind. We can walk to it. Hopefully it's a way out. Command sent authorization for them to proceed, and so they did. One reported that it appeared that they were back in the real world. The abstract shapes and colors, the infinite void was gone. They were in a Soviet research lab. There was medical equipment everywhere, syringes and jars full of, well, maybe it's best not to know what was in them. As Lambda 9 walked through the facility, checking every corner before rounding out, they felt a profound sense of unease. Surely enough, that feeling was warranted. Rounding the corner, one found some human remains. The man appeared to have been a researcher at one point. His brains were now stretched out and stuck to the walls like silly putty. What the hell happened here? Safely on British soil, the man who had defected from the Soviet Union sat in the interview room, chewing his bottom lip. He had spent so much time focusing on how he would escape with his life that he hadn't spared much thought for what he would say once he was on the other side. They had codenamed him Iceman, but he didn't feel particularly cold at that moment. He felt nervous, but he did his best to hide it. I was a project manager in the Psychotronics Division of the Main Intelligence Directorate. I oversaw Project Redline, which was commissioned by Joseph Stalin following the Second World War. And before he knew what he was doing, he told his interviewer everything. Over 20 million Soviets had died during the Second World War. Their death toll eclipsed that of any other country. Iceman had witnessed it all. So when Stalin had come to him with the task of creating an ultra-powerful psychic weapon, something that could convert the entire world population to adopt Marxism-Leninism, 
the man had his reservations. Activating a device like that could trigger a war even deadlier than either of the two already experienced that century. He was part of GRU Division P, the Russian arm of highly classified experimental research. Conferring with his team, they devised a plan. They would argue they needed absolute secrecy to carry out their work, even away from the watching eyes of the KGB. Rather than create a weapon, they would create a tool for peace. Instead of promoting the values of communism, they would create a psychic tool to dampen humanity's inclination towards violence and aggression. Their method would be brutal, but a necessary evil. In short, their theory was the psychic mind is often limited by the human body. A young child could have incredible psychic potential, but their physical limitations would hold them back from exercising it. Therefore, they needed to separate mind from body, and they had just the trick for that. Traumatic disassociation. They would take a young, gifted psychic and tear out their mind in order to transfer that mind into the body of a controllable avatar. Iceman explained that none of them could have expected how much fate would look favorably on them. Just two years prior, the KGB had captured and brought in a set of triplets for them. The triplets were incredibly rare, conjoined at both the head and the torso, with three arms and six legs. It was a miracle they were still alive, so Iceman and his team set to work immediately. They dosed the triplets up with as many mind-altering chemicals as they could physically endure before electrocuting them for prolonged periods whilst reading anti-violent manifestos to them. It worked. The triplets' minds disassociated, and the Soviets were able to capture it. Iceman was not forthcoming about what they did with the mind or where they transferred it. All he explained was that it worked. They took the weapon to the Norlag Gulag. 50,000 of the most vicious criminals known to man. Luthers, murderers, psychopaths dropped their makeshift knives and refused to move an inch. Even as we threw the gates of the camp wide open, we did that. The final test was on Nikita Khrushchev and John F. Kennedy. From thousands of kilometers away, they activated Project Redline and influenced the two world leaders at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis. War was averted, but Khrushchev was furious. He removed the entire team, killing a number of them, and began to weaponize Project Redline. If they could fire it at an advancing army, they'd never lose a single soldier ever again. To do this, it needed to be stronger. They were to implant the consciousness into another subject, torture them further, and disassociate again, amplifying the psychic abilities. Mobile Task Force Lambda 9 were stuck in the facility. The blizzard had been so strong that 7 and 8 had to return to base the previous night and come back. Having spent a night lost and wandering through the helix, descending deeper and deeper, the team had noticed that the world around them was getting darker. Periodically, they could hear Force screaming and falling past them once again before dropping out of sight again beneath them. They had tried to catch him, to pull him back, but he was always just out of reach, desperate to be saved. Seven and Eight returned and their psychic puppet radio contact was resumed with command. The team found another door. Searching through it, they were horrified to find their own corpses floating in the air in front of them, dressed up in lab coats. Just like the scientists from the levels above them, their brains were stretching out and lying together in some kind of web. Yet further down the helix, they found another door. One and three decided to go inside, leaving the rest of the team standing on the helix, ready to catch four if he fell past again. This time, two was in contact with command through his psychic link to the men by the chopper. He soon reported hearing four screams getting closer and closer. The group stood around, ready to catch him. There he is. I can see him. He's definitely falling towards us. Yeah, I see it too. Command, there's something up with four. It looks like he's spread eagled. His arms are stretched out. He's, he's screaming. It's not getting louder. It's getting flatter. There would be no further contact with two, five, and six. By the time one and three returned from scouting out the room, they were alone. One couldn't even sense the presence of any of their squad mates anymore. They had no option but to continue to descend the helix into the darkness. The smell of burning flesh filled their noses. The echoes of death were all around them. Voices cried out in pain and fear. And then, new voices, speaking in Russian, cut over the top. Stop it. Give in. Don't resist. Resisting is bad. You'll be punished if you resist. Begin electrical discharge. 500 volts. 3 amps. Increase voltage every minute. The operatives had no choice but to listen to the memory of the triplets being tortured. 
Not just the sounds, but the emotions that flood them. Those weren't someone else's memories anymore. They were becoming their own. And just as they saw into the mind of the triplets, the triplets saw them in return. Command, it's trying to open me up like it did everyone else, but I can see into it. It's learning from us. It knows of all about me. The squad, the foundation, they're almost on me. It's, it's the conjunction, the scientists, the monsters that made this thing, the ones it knew before it died, was that they wanted it to conjunct. It wants to make us part of it. Don't come back here. It wants to make the whole world part of it. And at that moment, the entirety of Mobile Task Force Lambda 9 dropped dead. In that same moment, a multicolored sphere of energy five kilometers wide appeared over the facility, dwarfing the mountains around it, designated SCP-2664-. For years, the Foundation dropped psionically dampening materials and psionically stumped D-Class personnel into the sphere in hopes of slowing its growth. No other containment measures could be acted upon. That was until 1300 hours on the 25th of December 2000, Christmas Day. SCP-2664-8 suddenly fluctuated, releasing an enormous amount of psionic energy that resulted in the brain death of all humans within a 200-kilometer radius. The following day, at 1700 hours, a Global Occult Coalition satellite launched a spherical payload right into the heart of SCP-2664-8. For 13 minutes, tremendous amounts of radiation were detected emanating from inside the sphere, before just as suddenly as it had appeared, SCP-2664-8 disappeared entirely, leaving just the payload in its place. Before the Foundation was able to recover the payload, it launched into the atmosphere and was lost. Subsequent reconnaissance operations to the site have confirmed no abnormal radioactive or psionic readings. To all intents and purposes, SCP-2664 appears to be gone. As such, the file has been marked as neutralized. Long may it stay that way. Step right up, folks! We've got all kinds of refreshing and tasty treats here for you today! Popcorn, peanuts, cotton candy, and even fried dough! Yes, sir, here at SCP Explained, we're offering the top-of-the-line anomalous delectable foodstuffs for all your circus-themed fun-time occasions! And that's because today, yes, today, on this YouTube platform, our infamous acronym doesn't stand for Secure, Contain, Protect. It stands for Sweet Confectionery Products. And let me tell you, dear viewer, the SCP we're looking at today just might be the most decadent, durable, and dangerous dessert that's ever desired to be devoured. We're talking about SCP-3077, or as they are better known, the Sugar Golems. These little fellas are safe class and are so totally harmless, so long as you take the proper precautions. What's the matter, don't you believe me? Don't you think it's nice of us to cover a safe SCP now and again? And hey now! Why all this dull talk about rules and regulations in the first place? You don't go out to the carnival to not take wild and exciting risks. Every spinny, twirly, and whirly ride on the fairgrounds comes with a statistically higher chance of a tragic mishap befalling you and any other thrill seekers around you. But we all take that chance anyway for the extraordinary rush of the experience. And such is the wacky and wonderful ways of our adorable and questionably edible chums. The sugar golems. Don't you just love them, folks? Ain't they a sight for sore eyes and a pang for sweet teeth? Well, we're only just getting started. The best is yet to come, ladies and not ladies. So pull up a chair and be sure to watch what we've got in store. You can make like a piece of old candy and stick around. <laughs> now that's a knee slapper, ain't it? <laughs> Sit back, relax, and make sure to enjoy the show. You should also subscribe to SCP Explained if you'd like to continue to be entertained. Hey, that rhymed! What do you know? I'm a poet and I didn't even know it. Ha! <laughs> Out roll! While SCP-3077 refers to the anomalous substance contained in Site-81, the semi-humanoid instances, which are nicknamed sugar golems, are themselves an animate and independent byproduct that naturally spawns from SCP-3077 when it is allowed to exist outside of containment procedures. The most important of these containment procedures being that SCP-3077 must remain at a constant temperature of well below its freezing point, and only be stored in containers full to capacity, lest its aforementioned byproducts attempt to breach containment. The total volume of SCP-3077 within the cryogenic containment unit equals almost 2200 liters, and it is believed to be the only known quantity of the anomalous substance in existence. 
For the sake of clarity in distinguishing between SCP-3077 and its byproducts, we'll be referring to the main object contained by the Foundation as SCP-3077, while the gooey little guys who we know to spontaneously split off from the source of SCP-3077 will be regarded as SCP-3077-1. As mentioned before, SCP-3077-1 instances have been affectionately dubbed the Sugar Golems. Every instance of SCP-3077-1 resembles an approximately one meter tall gaunt humanoid, composed of a pure sugar-derived substance commonly known as treacle. And that's molasses for all y'all yeehaw cowboys over there in the US of A. If you've ever played the classic board game Candyland, you'll have some idea of what an individual instance of SCP-3077 looks like from the beloved and often remembered character of Gloppy, who lives in the molasses swamp section of the board and is also fittingly made out of molasses himself. Yes, indeed, Gloppy is truly a delight for a weary Candyland player to meet. What did you say? Are you folks too young to know about Candyland? Well, that factoid certainly makes this narrator feel pretty old. Then again, I am taking on the mannerisms and attire of an old-fashioned carnival barker, so I suppose a bit of novel antiquity comes with the territory. Regardless, the golems are each composed of roughly seven liters of sweet, syrupy goodness. And very much like everyone's favorite character, Gloppy, they all lack defined lower bodies and can all emote through crude yet oddly endearing vocalizations in the place of intelligible speech. While their facial features are simplistic and misshapen, the contours of concave eyes and gaping mouth are usually present. The exact number of these eyes and mouths is subject to variation, much like the color of the board spaces in a wonderful wholesome family game of Candyland. While each SCP-3077-1 instance is around the same size, the body proportions and overall shape of each instance are rather fluid, pun fully intended. Some possess oversized arms or bulbous heads, while others might be conjoined to an adjacent sugar golem, as if to show that the two are inseparable as a pair of best buddies. Or, as some others might put it, a couple of BFFFs, best friends for fancy frolicking. They really are quite friendly looking, aren't they? And aren't they, they sure are. For the only thing that these sugary sweet SCP instances want is to be in the company of human beings just like you. Yes, you! Who else would I be talking to? It's a hard life for this worn down Connie, let me tell you. These little sugar golems love what they do and do what they love. But that doesn't mean that it's time for fun and games. Even though SCP-3077-1 instances want to hang around human beings, they don't tend to stop at hey and hello or whatever those appropriate greetings sound like when they are being gurgled by a diminutive molten sugar monster. Things can get out of hand real fast. Just like an orange cream popsicle melting in the sun of a late summer's day. Now listen up, it's important that you pay attention to what I say next. I'm about to book learn you about what to do if an instance of SCP-3077-1 enters your personal space. The results of prolonged contact with this SCP can end badly if you're not careful. I'm not going to sugarcoat any of the chewy details of your grisly fate, and I promise that it won't be a cakewalk. So don't be a nerd and listen up. Yes, that's right, I called you a nerd. You know, like nerds, the candy. How do you folks seriously not know nerds? They were a classic Halloween candy from the Wonka Company, and they were very popular back in the day. Oh, what's that you say? How long ago was it back in the day for me? Uh, that's a bit of a rude question, wouldn't you say? Oh, why I oughta... Won't you go ahead and knock it off with the wise guy questions? What are you, a pack of smarties? Ha <laughs> ha, I said smarties, get it? It's just like the... Ah, never mind. Let's just move on to the explanation of how to survive a close encounter with this SCP. That was the main reason you came all this way to this here educational and entertaining video presentation after all. To pick up where I left off, instances of SCP-3077-1 have a tendency to seek out nearby human life. The reason for doing so is surprisingly simple and alarmingly, well, alarming. These sticky saccharine simulacra are solely set on slithering into people's mouths for the purposes of gaining total control of their bodies. Yes, you heard that right. Believe it or not, the same anomalous property which animates the sugar golem's treacle bodies is apparently capable of overriding the human nervous system from the inside. And that's no joke, folks. While these tasty treats might sound sweet to eat, you'll be a puppet of meat from your head to your feet if you don't complete the tasks I entreat. If an instance of SCP-3077-1 attempts to enter your mouth, you must remember first and foremost to keep your trap shut. 
blocking it with a mask or a similar article of clothing if need be. Next, you must use your limbs and all available implements to batter the attacking golem away, while you do your best to keep a distance of at least arm's reach between yourself and the instance. It should come as a relief to our rational people that SCP-3077-1 instances are severely limited in their physical capabilities, and an adult human of average fitness can easily hold one off if they know what to expect. The tricky part comes from the amorphous properties of the instance's viscous treacle bodies, as well as their anomalous ability to regenerate from any physical trauma. The only way to permanently destroy an instance of SCP-3077-1 is to expose it to temperatures above its melting point, which for you sticklers out there is approximately 176 degrees Celsius. The most effective weapons against SCP-3077-1 instances include firebombs, flamethrowers, and your run-of-the-mill convection ovens. If it is at all possible to contain the instance within a sealed vessel such as a large Tupperware or wooden barrel, mm -hmm. then you ought to do whatever you can to prevent the candy creeps from running amok. While ordinary below zero temperatures are unable to destroy the anomalous treacle of SCP-3077, instances of SCP-3077-1 can effectively be slowed down or stopped completely if you put them on ice. Whether it's the hot foot or the cold shoulder, some form of extreme temperature should always be weaponized when defending oneself from an SCP-3077-1 instance. Any attempt to crush or smash an SCP-3077-1 instance will only result in the bad bonbon breaking apart and reforming into several more belligerent bite-sized blighters! A human under siege by the sugar golems might find themselves quickly outnumbered if they foolishly attempt to use a melee weapon against the anomalies. Basically, it's like a more delicious version of the popular arcade video game Asteroids. No? Eh, I guess that reference was from before even my time. At any rate, instances of SCP-3077-1 are difficult to destroy without access to heat or freezing. The tendency of the molasses menaces to increase in number is made even worse because of the fact that any amount of SCP-3077 outside of containment can generate a nearly infinite number of SCP-3077-1. While even an army of SCP-3077-1 instances is far weaker than an equivalent pack of hunting animals, the ability to continuously multiply and physiology that doesn't experience the consequences of fatigue means that, given enough time, the sugar golems can outlast any amount of human resistance until they roll over their preferred prey like a slow, insurmountable, syrupy tsunami of surrender! Seriously scary stuff, some would say. But what happens next is the real kicker, folks. Mind this Ballyhoo's somber spiel. If an instance of SCP-3077-1 manages to, against all odds, clamber its way into a human chatterbox and hijack the poor sap's nervous system, the victim is immediately classified as SCP-3077-2. SCP-3077-2 instances are easily distinguished from unaffected humans on site alone. Dark tendrils of SCP-3077 can be seen visibly moving beneath the skin, and often emerge from the mouth to crisscross the instance's face, like makeup, the world's most disturbing circus clown. That's not all! After the tragic treacly transformation takes place, the movements exhibited by the instance of SCP-3077-2 will become crooked and jerky like a marionette puppeteered by a frustrated chimpanzee! During this time, the instance remains fully conscious, retaining whatever cognitive faculties it has possessed previous to its classification, but it is unable to attempt speech or exert autonomy over its own actions. This fun fact was discovered by studying the EEG recordings of several SCP-3077-2 instances, and is brought to you by the United Guild of the Existentially Terrified. If an instance of SCP-3077-2 happens to wander its way into the vicinity of any humans that haven't succumbed to the process of consuming SCP-3077-1, it will proceed to put on a jaunty performance for its newfound audience. This peculiar display involves clumsy efforts at dance choreography and the throaty singing of unsettling eternal melodies that would make your annoying cousin's road trip songs sound like they're in tune. These awkward performances continue until the audience departs from the view of SCP-3077-2 instance, or the instance expires. This confirms that the point of the gesture is to entertain, as without an audience, the SCP-3077-2 instance is not compelled to make any noises of its own accord, and in general doesn't do anything other than move around aimlessly. 
In the event that any number of SCP-3077-1 instances escapes from containment and causes the creation of SCP-3077-2, members of the Mobile Task Force are instructed to never stray from the line of sight of a currently performing SCP-3077-2 instance and to approach it steadily before restraining the instance while causing minimal harm to the body. SCP-3077-2 instances can be useful for running further tests on the anomalous properties of SCP-3077, and there are simple procedures that allow an instance to be kept alive indefinitely in containment. Any damage sustained during capture can severely hamper the efficiency of these life-sustaining procedures. The worst case scenario is that an SCP-3077-2 instance expires before being securely contained as this will cause the SCP-3077-1 instance to emerge from its host and resume its relentless attack on all nearby humans. It is far easier to simply deal with SCP-3077-2 instances accordingly, and this is because SCP-3077-2 only ever attempts to continue the performance and possesses neither the intention nor the capacity for retaliation. If it is deemed necessary for the effectiveness of a recapture effort, it can be permissible for the Mobile Task Force to allow instances of SCP-3077-1 outside of containing to find purchase within SCP-3077-2 to increase the ease of containment and lessen the risk of Foundation personnel being affected. The performances of SCP-3077-2 instances are rarely physically intensive enough to make capture too difficult, but it can be said that the whimsical antics of these affected humans are anything but predictable. During some rare and special performances, and if the SCP-3077-1 instance in control of SCP-3077-2 instance is feeling especially daring, it may try to show off an array of woefully inadequate acrobatic skills. Front flips that are more like belly flops, back flips that could be mistaken for pratfalls, and the sort of type road pan trapeze acts that are better left to the imagination. In lieu of prior incidents, the Foundation strongly advises that if for any reason an instance of SCP-3077-2 must exist in containment, it must always be prevented from being at an altitude of more than six feet from the surface of the floor, especially if any humans it would perceive as an audience are located directly beneath where its performance would take place. Regarding the creation of further instances of SCP-3077-2, requests from any level of Foundation personnel at Site-81 or elsewhere must be granted permission to proceed by SCP-3077's head researcher because of the horrific implications of what happens to the still-aware human mind while the body is affected by SCP-3077-1. This process is only to be approved for use on D-Class personnel. That's right! And even then, in the event that all the rigmarole of the paperwork goes through, it is not acceptable to create an instance of SCP-3077-2 merely for the purpose of providing live entertainment to fellow researchers. After all, not a single one of us should be quick to forget the grotesque and highly regrettable spectacle that was Dr. Dietz's deplorable D-Class dancers. Every researcher involved with that ethical nightmare was reprimanded severely and the colorful novelty costumes and jangling bells that all former D-Class personnel were made to wear after being reclassified to SCP-3077-2 have been permanently confiscated. Let the cotton candy machine and peanut dispenser located just outside the containment unit of SCP-3077 serve as a stern reminder that there's a time and place for monkey shines and tomfoolery, and sometimes, yes, even now and then, a highly secure Foundation facility is neither the right place nor the right time. In case you haven't picked up on it, there are very few practical applications of SCP-3077 due to the fact that its status as a food dish is negated by the consequences of consumption. The main reason for tests to be administered on SCP-3077-2 instances is to discover if there is a safe method of extracting an SCP-3077-1 instance from the body of its host without causing the expiration of the original human. Unfortunately, due to a persistent lack of success, the experiments have been discontinued indefinitely. But that just won't do. How else are we supposed to know if these things actually taste as good as they look? I won't rest until everyone is able to harmlessly ingest a sugar golem of their very own. I might be old fashioned, but to me, the safe object class isn't just a designation, it's an invitation. I ought to be completely okay doing whatever I like around a safe object because it's safe. 
That word should actually mean something. Ding, dang, darn it. And I don't mean that in the sense that the SCP Foundation uses it. Meaning an anomaly that doesn't present an active threat to containment efforts. And more importantly, there aren't that many anomalies that are also delicious candy. And I want to eat this one. Sorry, 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 I lost my cool a bit there. I just have a sweet tooth and my brain is constantly drifting back to my nostalgic childhood memories of playing Candyland with my family. That was before they all decided that they wanted nothing to do with me because I became so obsessed with dressing up like a carnival barker that I drove away everyone who's ever cared about me. Other than that, my job here at the Foundation explaining confectionery SCPs is the only thing I have left in my sad, sad life. Some days I feel less like Gloppy and more like a real Lord Licorice. In hard times like these, a fellow could really use some entertainment to cheer himself up. Wait, just a flea jumping moment! What was that? What's the big idea? How did these escaped instances of SCP-3077-2 get in here? They're all supposed to be in safe containment a few floors down! Did somebody else from the research team let them in here because they knew I was in costume standing in front of a pretend fairground set? That's in pretty poor taste, don't you think? Pun very much intended. I should probably report it to the head researcher. That would be the ethical, reasonable thing to do. Then again, look at them go. Those are sure some hilarious dances. I'm definitely seeing a snappy attempt at doing the Charleston. A classic. And is that one doing the worm or is it just kind of flopping on the floor? I think one of these instances knows about that Fortnite stuff all the kids are into these days, but I'm not sure if the human element or the golem that decides what dances it knows. Either way, this was exactly what I needed to feel so much better. For once, it feels like I'm actually at a carnival instead of just pretending to be at one now. This is the greatest performance I've ever seen in all my years, which you can be sure that there have been a lot of. The tiny carnivorous snowmen are relentless. Sharp fangs dripping with blood as they crawl en masse towards the mobile task force, opening fire on them with their assault rifles. Who would have guessed that a mere hour or two earlier, a young boy was joyfully playing around in the snow here? How had things gone from frosty to freaky so fast? Let's rewind the clock. There was a chill in the air, that lingering, biting cold that would gnaw at your exposed skin if you dared to step outside in anything less than a thick, warm coat for protection. The ground was still coated in a heavy snowfall, a holdover from Christmas just past, weather that had refused to let up well into the early days of the new year. Everyone reaches an age where the cynicism of life, the weight of expectations that keep you anchored in the real world, they all coalesce to rob you of the childlike wonder of the snow. As you get older, the snow loses its novelty. It becomes a source of inconvenience, something that you need to shovel off the driveway to take your car out. Whereas, turn the clock back to youth, and it's like a tiny miracle. It coats your whole world in a clean blanket of freezing frost, turning the ordinary into a wonderland. Robert and Michaela Anderson were glad that their son Michael was still at an age where he could enjoy the snow. After all, Michaela getting to take her son out in his sled or seeing him hurling snowballs at Robert was able to provide them with a little bit of warmth during the freezing cold, snowier months in Missouri. Optimism was never enough to melt the snow, however, and maybe that's what drew in those creatures, the snowmen. It was early 2019, not even a full two weeks into the year. By now, Michael had gotten used to the fact that after Christmas and New Year's Day, a begrudging return to school would soon follow. As much as it clearly brought down his mood, nothing lifted his spirits like still getting to be out in the snow. And after a long day of helping his mom take down the tinsel and pack up the lights while his dad disposed of the tree, Michael was itching to go outside. Please, Mom? He begged as a box of decorations was placed back in the attic. His hands clasped together in a pleading gesture. Please, 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 just five minutes. I, I won't go further than the front yard. Michaela sighed, partly from exhaustion, but a smile crept onto her face. It was hard not to find her son's love for the snow endearing. All right, but only for five minutes, she insisted firmly. And I want to see gloves, hat, and a scarf, not just a coat, mister. With the speed and excitement that she and her husband had long since lost, she watched Michael race off to gather his warmest winter coat. Remember when we were like that? Robert heaved a sigh as he appeared from chopping up that dried out, dehydrated remains of the Christmas tree. No, do you? Michaela replied with a light chuckle. Before long, Michael had donned his gloves and coat, 
almost a size too big. His scarf was almost wrapping up his entire head, save for the little bobble hat that poked out at the top. Robert opened up the front door and his son stepped out into a world that had been whitewashed with clear, cold snow. Given that the Andersons lived on a small street in Grain Valley, there weren't many other people around, especially not with another flurry of snowfall moving closer in the clouds up above. But it wasn't the next snowfall that the residents of Grain Valley, Missouri should have been worrying about. It was the previous one, the one that had already fallen and what was now hiding among the snow in the Anderson family's front yard. Having few other kids his own age to play with and not being allowed to venture too far from the front porch, Michael was content to spend his precious time outdoors making snow angels or practicing throwing snowballs. He had long been trying to get one to clear the roof of the small house he and his parents shared, leaving a few scattered patches of snow embedded on the roof shingles. A few meters from the front door stood a snowman, Granted, that was hardly a rare sight at this time of year, especially in the cold weather, but what was so unusual about it was that Michael hadn't remembered making a snowman recently. His parents hadn't let him out in the snow on his own since the start of the new year, given how badly the downfall and icy winds had been for the first week of January. Sure, somebody else could have made it, taking a pause as they passed by the Andersons' front yard, although not Michael nor either of his parents had spotted anyone doing that. The snowman itself was featureless, the white of its ice-cold body smeared with mud and dead leaves, debris that had been packed in with the snow used in its crude construction. It was featureless, too. Whoever had made it hadn't gone to the effort of giving it a face, nor draped an old scarf over it or given it a hat. It just stood there, but not like any other snowman. There was nothing welcoming about it. In fact, it was, fittingly, cold. Given how far away it stood, it was almost as if it was watching the house. Curiously, Michael began to approach the snowman. Being only nine years old, his imagination was immediately running with the possibility that this snow and mulch construct could be alive, much akin to the likes of Frosty the Snowman. Little did young Michael Anderson know that he wasn't far away from the truth. Although this particular snowman wasn't quite the happy, jolly soul, from the much-covered holiday song. He hadn't got that much closer to the snowman when he heard something move nearer to where he stood. There was the rustle of leaves and the snapping of small twigs coming up from a bush next to him. Michael couldn't see what it was, but it was far too low to the ground and too close to the house for it to be a bird. Maybe a possum or raccoon had gotten trapped in the thin branches and was now scrambling to try and free itself. Diverting from approaching the snowman, he walked closer to the plant. As he did, the rustling got louder, more frantic, almost hungry. There wasn't just one creature lurking out of sight beneath the leaves, but lots of somethings. Robert and Michaela had been sitting indoors watching the TV when they heard a spine-chilling scream coming from outside. Instantly, they were both up on their feet, racing toward the front door. Robert threw it open and Michael dashed inside in floods of fearful tears. What happened, sweetie? Michaela asked, concerned, brushing snowflakes from her son's coat. Are you okay? Did you slip? Through crying and sniffling, shaking uncontrollably with how afraid he was, Michael couldn't find the words to answer. Instead, he pointed through the still open door directly at the snowman, still standing at the edge of the front yard. How long has that been there? Robert wondered aloud, taking a single step outside. Don't, Dad! Michael screamed but it was already too late. Something small and speedy had leaped out of the snow in the front yard and latched onto Robert's leg. He howled as he felt searing pain, bitten by rows of tiny pointed teeth, as sharp as needles and as bitterly cold as ice. Stumbling back, Robert Anderson fell over and landed on the floor in the front hallway, inadvertently carrying whatever had attacked him into his home. Both Michaela and Michael screamed in fear as the tiny creature clawed its way up Robert's leg while he swatted at it frantically, trying to brush it away before it could get closer. With a blind swipe of his hand, he knocked the creature to the floor and clambered to his feet, arms outstretched, keeping his wife and son behind him, while staring in disbelief at what had bitten him. It was barely more than half a meter tall, a tiny, white snowman. Bulbous, bloodied eyes bulged from its head, much like those of an insect. Directly between the eyes was a hole, a mouth not unlike a lamprey, lined with rows of sharp teeth that all pointed inwards. It reared up and lunged toward the Anderson family, in a display of aggression that caused all three of them to jump. 
warily backing away from the snow creature. It was then that Robert and Michaela noticed what had frightened their son so much. Out of the corner of their eye, they both simultaneously caught the sight of the open front door and the yard beyond. Wriggling through the snow, shifting as they moved, were even more of the creatures, slithering towards the house like piranhas catching the scent of blood in the water. And standing ominously just beyond the driveway was the snowman, as if it was the general commanding its troops to storm the house. The Andersons raced upstairs as the swarm of snow creatures came spilling into the house, crawling from the yard onto the floor and piling on top of each other, like ants to climb the stairs. Naturally, Michaela's first instinct, as well as protecting her son, was to call the police. While Robert held the door to the bedroom shut, Michaela held Michael close and pleaded with the local Green Valley Police Department to come and help them. Although they only seemed to take the call seriously, when Michael started screaming again, one of the snow creatures had pushed its way under the doorframe and was sneaking its way towards Robert to attack him, leaving a trail of water behind it. Stepping back and thinking fast, Robert grabbed a hairdryer and switched it on full blast. The sudden rush of electrically heated air caused the toothy snow creature to retreat into a corner. Refusing to let up, Robert got closer and kept the hairdryer trained on it, eventually causing the creature to melt until little more was left than a damp puddle. But the victory was momentary. There were still more of them crawling up the stairs after the Andersons. With their sharp teeth, they were gnawing at the wood of the bedroom door, trying to force their way inside. Fortunately for Robert, Michaela, and their son Michael, they wouldn't be able to recall the horrific events of January 12, 2019 for much longer. By the time the local police arrived, it had become clear to the officers responding that they were well out of their depth, especially when one of them was injured, suffering a bite from a snow creature. That was what led the SCP Foundation being called in, and within 15 minutes, they had dispatched mobile task force operatives to secure the anomaly. Being some of the Foundation's most highly trained agents, it didn't take long for the MTF to neutralize the carnivorous snow creatures. However, they quickly realized that the mysterious snowmen that had seemingly spawned the swarm could not be melted by any conventional means, nor would it deteriorate naturally on its own. A cover story was issued that Michael had suffered an accident and fallen down an open pothole that had become obscured by heavy snowfall. As a result, police officers were dispatched to help him, although the injury sustained by one officer due to a bite from a snow creature was never explained. Following this, the Anderson family was administered amnestics, meaning they quickly forgot about the whole terrifying ordeal. Maybe it was for the best, however. Young Michael seemed irreparably changed. He never went out to enjoy the snow again repeatedly suffering from nightmares about the cold. Meanwhile, the anomalous snowman was recovered and thus designated as SCP-4230. Immediately, the SCP Foundation did as their organization does best and commenced testing, with a human subject, no less. They quickly discovered that SCP-4230 seemed to generate a sort of field around itself that could trigger a distinctive physiological change in any human being or animal that came within six meters of the snowman. This process became known under the designation of SCP-4230-1. It appeared that Michael Anderson had managed to unknowingly escape this fate purely by not getting too close to SCP-4230, staying just far enough away so as not to trigger SCP-4230-1. The Foundation placed D-19375, a member of their D-Class personnel, within this 6-meter radius of the snowman and observed the gradual changes he underwent over the following week. For simplicity's sake, we'll refer to D-19375 as Frost, a rather fitting moniker, and you'll soon see why. Within a day of exposure to the snowman, Frost complained to a senior researcher that he felt a lot colder than usual, although he exhibited no other observable symptoms beyond the coughing and sniffling of a common cold. By the following day, Frost was far worse for wear, appearing to have lost significant body mass to the point where he'd appeared to have been malnourished. His cold-like symptoms had continued, accompanied by disorienting dizziness, and as if all that wasn't bad enough, his skin tone had seemingly lost its natural pigment, reduced to an unnaturally pale shade, as white as snow. Day 3 saw Frost's body continue to change rapidly at an alarming rate. He was internally producing an unknown chemical that looked to be responsible for enacting certain alterations, namely the dissolving of his femur and fibula. The cold and dizziness were also now made all the worse by the addition of pain to the man's lower body. 
Frost even reported to Foundation researchers studying him that every movement he was able to make caused him to suffer extreme levels of physical pain. But yet, rather than attempt to cure his condition, the Foundation apathetically observed, noting down the process of SCP-4230-1. Within five days of exposure to SCP-4230, naturally occurring substances within Frost's body had traveled downwards and solidified. This was followed by the most shocking stage of the SCP-4230-1 process so far, and one that made the Foundation realize that these weren't just changes, it was a transformation. When Day 5 saw Frost's skeleton physically reshaping itself, his head becoming a sphere and his arms extending outwards like brittle twigs, it soon became clear what was happening to him. He was turning into a snowman. Rendered immobile and blind, a week after SCP-4230-1 began to take effect, Frost had started to secrete an unknown substance. This liquid lowered his body temperature, freezing almost instantly, and turning his skin into an icy white mass, worryingly similar to snow. Sure enough, on the eighth day, the extent of the SCP-4230-1 process was made evident. Frost had already perished, his body now looking identical to a plain, featureless snowman. No eyes or face, just a blank, cold slate. But underneath the outer layer of snow, Frost's bones and the rest of his organs were still contained inside. From the outside, though, he wasn't even human anymore. Just an instance of what became known as SCP-4230-A. However, being turned into another snowman by close proximity to SCP-4230 wasn't even the worst part. By now, you might be wondering, what were those snow creatures that attacked the Andersons? You'd be forgiven for thinking that perhaps these were rodents or other wild animals affected by SCP-4230-1. After all, testing has shown that the process doesn't just alter human physiology, but these carnivorous needle-toothed creatures are known as SCP-4230-Bs and they are nasty little critters, to say the least. When a person or animal is turned into a snowman during SCP-4230-1, becoming one of these instances is far from the full extent of the transformation. The test the Foundation conducted on Frost, and presumably on numerous other D-Class personnel as well, led to them discovering the further alterations made when someone becomes an SCP-4230-A instance. Their freezing, snow-encased bodies become hosts for white, spherical eggs. After a subject like Frost becomes an SCP-4230-A snowman, these eggs will hatch within 72 hours, producing up to 19 instances of SCP-4230-B creatures. The Foundation was quick to examine these bizarre snow spawn, gathering up as many as they could for testing. They found that instances of SCP-4230-B matured to adulthood remarkably quickly, reaching adulthood in 15 seconds. Destroying the eggs containing these creatures seemed to be an effective way of preventing swarms of SCP-4230-Bs from getting loose, although the snowman each egg came from would also have to be destroyed to achieve this result. Also, the lifespans of the smaller snow creatures only lasted for a total of 24 hours, and they would melt away after a full day of life regardless of the surrounding temperature. SCP-4230-Bs seem uninterested in food that was presented to them. Specifically, one test involved giving a snow creature a head of lettuce and a watermelon. The creature regarded the fruit and vegetables with little interest, even refusing to eat either despite prompts from the researchers. This painted the SCP-4230-Bs as exclusive carnivores, which explained why they attacked the Anderson family. They were trying to eat them hunting the Andersons as a pack. Further testing into SCP-4230-Bs revealed they had a weakness to heat above a temperature of 40 degrees Fahrenheit. During another test, a D-Class was sent into a cell with 10 of the carnivorous snow creatures, armed only with a simple lighter, an emergency flare, and one gallon of gasoline. Immediately, all 10 of the SCP-4230-Bs crawled toward the man, hungry, and determined him to be a new source of food. That is, until they noticed the lighter he was carrying. The D-Class frantically clicked the spark wheel until the flame danced from the lighter, causing seven of the creatures to back away from the heat source cautiously. The D-Class was able to kill the remaining three instances in self-defense, causing them to melt with little effort. He was far luckier than the subject of the next test would be. Another D-Class was placed in a holding cell with three of the snow creatures, 
and much like before, they instantly acknowledged his presence and began approaching him. However, the Foundation had sent this member of D-Class in completely unarmed, without even so much as a match to defend himself. The carnivorous beasts made short work of their helpless victim, feeding on what was left. The Foundation was able to dispatch instances of SCP-4230-B with relative ease, even without waiting for them to simply melt after a day. The use of flamethrowers or drawing them into warmer areas seemed effective enough at destroying the small snowman that hatched out of SCP-4230-A bodies. However, some bright spark at the Foundation decided to test what would happen if the opposite element was used against SCP-4230-B creatures. Were they vulnerable to the snow despite being made from a snow-like substance themselves? Another test was conducted to answer this which involved a small snowball being thrown at one of the SCP-4230-Bs. The result of that incident has been entirely expunged from the Foundation's archives, but it's a safe guess to ask why. Evidently, when attacked using snow or ice, SCP-4230-Bs are seemingly able to adapt in some way that is determined to their attacker. Do they add snow to their mass or become even more aggressive? It's hard to say given the redactions, but the result of that final test were deemed so catastrophic that the Foundation banned any further testing that involved SCP-4230-Bs. As for where SCP-4230 first came from, the Foundation is still baffled. The first reported incident involving the killer snowman and the carnivorous creatures it produced came when the Andersons found themselves under siege by hungry SCP-4230-Bs. Maybe the snowman is just a freak of nature, or the result of an unknown pathogen or microorganism carried in a snowstorm one fateful night. Or perhaps SCP-4230 is something far, far more vicious. Whatever the case, we would recommend waiting for the sun to come back out and the snow to melt just to be safe. Nothing in life can prepare you for the raw heat of a house on fire. Throwing an arm up in front of his eyes and clasping a handkerchief to his mouth, Robert Chetford hacked up half of the contents of his lungs. Glancing at the material, he saw that his phlegm was black, poisoned by the smoke. A beam collapsed in front of him, sending a fresh wave of burning air into his face, so hot that it felt like it was going to scorch his ears off. He had to run. He had to get out of the house, but he knew he couldn't. His mother was upstairs. Robert barreled his way through the flames, shouldering open doors and stumbling along hallways. The air was so thick with smoke that he could barely breathe, so he collapsed to the floor and started to crawl on his stomach. He reached the first step of the grand staircase and started to heave himself up one at a time, feeling the heat of the house threatening to engulf him more with every inch he climbed. But he hadn't made it more than five steps before there was an enormous creaking sound and the whole staircase collapsed beneath him. Sparks rushed up into the air and swirled around the room. Flames licked at the walls all around him. As Robert looked around at the collapsed staircase, he knew that it was hopeless. With tears streaming down his cheeks, he pushed himself forward and ran out of the house. The firemen swarmed past him, filling the building and shouting to one another, but Robert just stood there, staring up at the top floor window. On the other side of the glass, surrounded by billowing smoke, he looked up at his mother, sitting as she always did on her rocking chair, utterly motionless as the house burned around her. In an undisclosed facility in the United States of America, you will find what may well be the lowest security containment cell in the entire SCP Foundation. There is no heavily armored door, no bulletproof glass, no machine guns about to drop down from the ceiling at any point. In fact, there's very little in the way of containment at all. They often leave the door to the cell wide open. There is a window, but on the other side of it isn't a crowd of researchers, security guards, and agents ready to spring into action at a moment's notice. It's just a normal double-glazed window that looks out across a vista of fields, trees, and a couple of power lines. Facing the window is an old armchair in which the concrete man sits, SCP-014. He spends all of his day, every day, staring out of the window. This view specifically was chosen because very little changes in it. Night turns to day, the trees change with the seasons, and it rains occasionally. But there are no roads, no new buildings springing up, 
nothing to distinguish it from how it looked in 1937. Beside him is a small table, home to a record player. In the corner of the room, there's an antique set of shelves that house three dozen old records, all dated from the 1930s or earlier. All day, every day, the music plays out of the old speaker. Every so often, as researchers walk up and down the corridor, if they hear that there isn't any music playing, they'll come into the room and change the record over for a new one. The newest researchers check in with SCP-014 to see if he's okay. He rarely responds, and so before long, they stop asking. You would think, therefore, that the concrete man is elderly, approaching the twilight years of his life. But the man who sits there in his chair, staring out of the window and listening to music from almost 100 years ago, appears to be just 30 years old. Friends of Robert Chetford reported a noticeable change in his demeanor following the fire and death of his mother. He had lost his father not long before to a workplace accident. William Chetford had been a construction worker, climbing up the girders of New York's emerging skyline, pouring concrete and piling bricks. He had been working on a new building, one that was said to be the tallest in the world called the Empire State Building. Day after day, he would climb the cranes, teeter precariously over the dizzying drops, any slight mistake, and he would plummet hundreds of feet, often to the busy streets below. Sure enough, one day, William Chetford's worst fears came to life. He was walking on a gangplank that wobbled and bent with every step he took. On his shoulders was a metal bar with a bucket of concrete dangled precariously from each tip. He walked this route every day, but clearly, that day proved too much for the wood to take. The board splintered and split beneath him, plunging him down and down through the scaffolding. William desperately reached out an arm and managed to grasp the edge of a girder. He hung there helplessly, staring up at his colleagues high above him. He cried out for help, and upon seeing him, they began to scramble down level by level to try and rescue him. He just needed to hang on for a moment longer, and they would rescue him. But one of them knocked over a bucket of concrete. William Chetford could do nothing but watch as the heavy sludge slowly tumbled towards his face. He tried to dodge it, but it was no use. The company told Mrs. Chetford that this had been William's saving grace, that he had been unconscious for the long fall down to the streets below. His fellow workers knew that this wasn't the case. They heard his screams all the way down. Mrs. Chetford didn't believe any of it. They were lying, all of them. The company, his co-workers, everybody. She knew what had really killed him. It was the same thing that was killing her slowly. The same thing that had been passed on to their son, concrete poisoning. She'd approached the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and any outlet she could, but none of them were remotely interested in the story. There were chemicals in the concrete. It wasn't safe to use. It never had been. She'd been working in nursing homes and seen the effects of concrete on construction workers. They'd become paralyzed, unable to move, spending so many years breathing concrete air, letting it absorb into their skin. Their bodies had slowly started to turn into it. She knew it. She started to go crazy, pinning up news clippings, medical journals, photographs, maps, anything she could find, all over her walls, her entire bedroom. She had red string hanging from the walls and ceiling connecting to every surface. Robert watched helplessly from the doorway, unable to do anything as he saw his mother steadily entering into psychosis. But the further her paranoia went, the less energy she seemed to have for it. Weeks went by, and her manic fervor was replaced with lethargy. She got slower and slower in her movements, talked less and less at mealtimes, and began to sit down for extended chunks of the day. Robert, assuming that she was tired from grief, did what he could to help. He carried an armchair up to her room and placed it in the corner by the window so that she could look out over the world around her. He thought she was resting, but it soon became apparent that she wasn't really resting. She was withdrawing almost freezing over. Desperate to try and get his mother to re-engage with the world, Robert sat down with her to try and understand all of her conspiracy theories around his father's death. She explained slowly and calmly that the concrete being used in New York was poisoned, cursed. She didn't know where it had been dug up from, how it had been mixed, or who was behind it, but she was getting close. Maybe it was the US government. Maybe it was the same witches. Maybe it was God himself. But she knew her husband, 
and she knew he wouldn't have fallen that day. He had walked across that plank thousands of times without incident. There was no way he would have made that mistake. Robert tried to connect the dots of what she was saying. Did she really think that it was the concrete that had killed his father? She said that it was and that the same concrete is now killing her. She showed him her hands, turned them over front and back under the light for him to inspect. They looked just like normal hands, elderly, wrinkled, with deep veins popping out, but normal. She scratched at them and tried to feign pain for the effects of her fingers. Look, she said, you see that powder coming off them? That's concrete powder. But Robert didn't see any of it. The concrete man came to the foundation's attention a couple decades ago. Construction workers in New York in the late 1990s were hard at work clearing out the foundations for a new skyscraper. The site was built on top of what used to be a residential block, but one intrepid builder soon discovered something that shook him to his core. There was an old cellar beneath where the building used to be. The lock on it was heavy, thick with rust, and had been open for close to 70 years. He and his team managed to pry it open, put on their flashlights, and went inside. What they found was a basement apartment still sitting there beneath the rubble. It was a relic of its time. Thick dust covered every surface, ugly wallpapers surrounded them, and ancient appliances covered with rust sat in the kitchen. It was almost like walking through a haunted house. The builders joked about ghosts stalking these corridors as they made their way through, until they reached the bedroom. Sliding the door open, they faced a man sitting there, staring at them from an old armchair. The four burly builders screamed like little girls for a split second, then burst out laughing when they realized that the man wasn't real. He must have been a waxwork or something. He was sitting so perfectly still and hadn't reacted at all to their presence. They went over to inspect what he was made out of. They tapped on his forehead, lifted his arms and dropped them, and were surprised at how convincing the fake man was. That was, of course, until he politely asked them not to touch him. This time, they really did scream like girls, running straight out of the basement into a local police station. This basement apartment was where Robert Chetford moved following the fire in his parents' home and the death of his paralyzed mother. Racked with guilt, he had never been quite able to process what had happened to cause his mother's mental state to deteriorate so rapidly. By the time she died, she had been looking at her hands and genuinely believed they were made of concrete. She would not move, she would not eat, she would not sleep. For days, she would just sit, staring out of her window. He knew he should have taken her to a doctor, but they just couldn't afford it. Maybe if he had, this would have all worked out differently. Robert would think about it hour after hour. He would sit down in the armchair in the corner of his room and ponder what had happened. It was difficult to keep track of time living in the basement. There were no windows, no daylight at all. But he didn't think he had been sitting there for very long when he noticed the skin on his hands starting to turn gray. Without panic, he slowly lifted his hands to his eyes and inspected what was happening. His fingers, down to about halfway through his palms, were dry and solid. He could move them just about, but it took a normal effort, and he could see cracks running along the back of the concrete when he did, so he decided not to. He wouldn't say he felt calm exactly, maybe disconnected. He didn't feel particularly hungry, he didn't feel particularly tired, in fact, he didn't feel much at all. His concrete limbs were only a passing curiosity to him as he sat in his chair. Very occasionally, he would get up to put on a record on his record player, then return to his seat and stare at the wall. That would be every couple of months at most. The rest of the time, he would just sit there. One day, he noticed in a vague corner of his mind that the ground was shaking and dust was filling the room. The ripping sound of dynamite and the heavy stone just above his head told him that the apartment block towering over him had fallen down and almost come through his ceiling. Robert just sat there, unconcerned. Another day, some indeterminate time later, a group of builders came in dressed in peculiar, futuristic clothing. With bright yellow hats and reflective vests, they seemed rather startled to see him, though in truth he had little care for seeing them. What did perturb him was when a group of people claiming to be agents from the Foundation came into his room and carried him out. He didn't like the noise, didn't like the change. If he wanted to move, he would move. Not that he could, of course. He was now entirely made of concrete, but that was beside the point. These people put him in the back of a van and drove him across half of the United States. 
They wheeled him through brightly lit rooms and into a disgusting modern white box. They had done the courtesy of bringing his chair along and found a new record player for him, with a whole selection of albums lining a shelf on the wall. He would have appreciated it and said thank you to them, but he didn't really care. He wasn't present at all. This was, of course, due to the fact that he was made of concrete by this point. However, once he was sat in his chair and took in the sight in front of him, Robert Chetford felt a dull panic rising in his chest. They placed him at a window, just like he'd placed his dying mother in front of a window. He tried to clench his jaw, tried to move his hands, tried to cry out in fear and pain, but he couldn't. He was paralyzed. The smell of smoke filled his chest, choking him torturing him as the memories of his burning household raged in his mind. He tried to scream. He tried to fight. He tried to do anything other than just sit there, but it was far too late for any of that. Good afternoon, Mr. Chetford, the researcher said, busying herself and putting on another album for him to listen to. Is there anything I can do for you, sir? Anything I can do to make you more comfortable? The concrete man said nothing. The researcher patted him on the back of his hand. Made of concrete indeed. Looks just like regular skin to me, Mr. Chetford. I do wonder what's going on inside that head of yours. On her way out of the room, she glanced at his view from the window. Beautiful weather outside today, isn't it? Scorching even. The creature let out an unmistakable squeal of rage, as stimulus Y835 took effect. Dr. Christensen pressed his face up against the glass, eager to see the results. It had to work this time. It simply had to. He was certain that this attempt would make all the other failures worth it, and he'd once again prove the Foundation's faith in him to be well-placed. SCP-5683 shrieked a loud, insect-like sound that would have normally made the blood run cold of anyone that heard it. But to Dr. Christensen, it was like music, a monster's dying fanfare to mark his success. Soon he'd be the researcher who neutralized not one, but two tenacious, highly adaptable anomalies. The senior researcher could feel his heart racing as the deadly giant spider started to twitch, then burst into two identical entities. The pair of arachnid anomalies had reacted much like the results of the tissue sample tests conducted earlier, dividing into two separate organisms. Christensen held his breath. The tissue samples had destroyed each other, attacking and injecting the other with lethal doses of venom. Surely, he reasoned, duplicating SCP-5683 into two would have the same result. His heart sank as he watched one of the spider creatures, the duplicate, perish almost immediately. As it often did when presented with human prey, SCP-5683 attacked using its mandibles and impaled its copy with its front legs to pin it in place. The clone had bitten back, with Dr. Christensen already knowing that would have granted SCP-5683 an immunity to its own venom. Its powers of adaptation were fiercely, frustratingly efficient, and nothing demonstrated this more than the intense reaction from the man tasked with destroying it. Dr. Christensen hurled the nearest object, a coffee mug, at a glass window of the observation room, overlooking the test chamber. He pounded his fist against the glass, hardly with the required force to cause damage, but enough to send pain shooting down Christensen's wrist, which then nestled in his forearm, a reminder that the experiment, like the others, had failed. Why can't I destroy you? He muttered through clenched teeth, looking with hatred at the enormous spider in the chamber below. The directive had reached him the day immediately after New Year's Day 2020 and straight from a member of the O5 Council, no less. Their message expressed how impressed the Council was with Dr. Christensen's success with the Doomsday Clock project, and how favorably his name had been mentioned in Council meetings. This boded well for the ambitious Foundation doctor. He'd been hoping to snag the Director position at Site-04, now that Director Bray had retired. But there was one more test from the O5 Council. They wanted Dr. Christensen to use the knowledge garnered during his previous success to solve the SCP-5683 problem. If he could successfully complete that assignment, it would be his ticket to being promoted. With the comfy role of site director and all its perks in mind, Dr. Christensen accepted the assignment from the Council to deal with SCP-5683. SCP-5683 was quite the beast, not an anomaly for those with intense arachnophobia, 
The huge spider-like organism was extremely hostile towards humans and had to be kept in a constant state of medical sedation. Otherwise, it would relentlessly attempt to breach containment and slaughter any and all personnel in its path. What had made SCP-5683 such a problem for the Foundation was the creature's ability to rapidly regenerate damage as well as modify its own body in reaction to threats. Much like a certain, particularly hard-to-destroy reptile, the spider-like entity could adapt itself to become more resistant to any danger posed to it. And of course, this meant that the Foundation needed this dangerous creature eradicated. The frequent containment breaches and sheer number of casualties caused by the arachnid anomaly were significant enough to cause an increasing drain on the SCP Foundation's resources. So, with the termination order coming from the very top, the O5 Council themselves, Dr. Christensen was tasked with overseeing the neutralization of SCP-5683. During an initial deliberation, Dr. Christensen met with researcher Miles and Hall, junior researcher Silva, and security chief Ade to discuss earlier attempts to terminate SCP-5683. The new head of the termination project was perturbed to learn that the research team had little in the way of useful information to offer beyond what the Foundation already knew about the creature. But Christensen decided some basic stress testing would at least be a start. After a successful tissue sample test, wherein some of SCP-5683's genetic material was incinerated, Dr. Christensen tried to simply destroy the spider with fire. An understandable response, to say the least. However, exposing SCP-5683 to temperatures of 850 degrees Celsius for just 30 seconds didn't quite yield the easy victory he had hoped for. The arachnid thrashed about and screeched in reaction to the heat, only to rapidly develop a form of armor plating covering its entire body. The armor was comprised of an unknown, unidentifiable substance, but it was enough to prevent SCP-5683 from combusting. Reconvening with the rest of the team, Dr. Christensen hid his pride, assuring everyone he was just trying to establish a baseline during the previous test. Of course, he hadn't believed that terminating SCP-5683 with fire would be a success, or so he claimed, hiding how much he'd longed for an easy solution so he could snatch up the vacant Site-04 director position. But to ensure the others, Christensen explained that he'd requisitioned some anomalous materials from the O5 Council that they'd be using in their next termination attempts. Nothing that was anomalous enough to require containment, but toxic enough that they presented a few options for destroying SCP-5683. Uh, just for logging purposes, sir, may I inquire about the specific substances we're shipping in? Junior researcher Sylvia had asked. Of course. Y220, Y835, and Y43. Dr. Christensen quickly recounted them all from memory. I'm told they should be arriving within the week. I expect each would be enough to do the job, but it's best to hedge our bets. This spider doesn't compare to the lizard, I'll tell you that. Junior researcher Silva seemed to take an interest in what Dr. Christensen had just alluded to, his previous work with the lizard. He probed further about it, and Christensen gave a solemn response. The aspiring Foundation doctor recalled an incident from a few years earlier during his experimentation with SCP-682. Some of the methods Dr. Christensen had opted to employ in an attempt to destroy the hard-to-destroy reptile had led to a severe containment breach. When describing it, he used the word unpleasant, perhaps out of guilt at how many personnel had lost their lives due to his actions. Brushing the topic aside, he assured the team to get on with testing the new anomalous stimuli on SCP-5683. Stimulus Y220 initially showed some promise. During a tissue sample test, it successfully converted part of SCP-5683 into glass, which then violently exploded, leaving nothing behind. But attempts to use it to neutralize the creature itself quickly quashed those promising results. Within nine seconds of being exposed to Stimulus Y220, SCP-5683's body rapidly turned to glass. Around 80% of its arachnid mass proceeded to explode, shattering in all directions, sending clear shards showering over the testing chamber. As he watched, Dr. Christensen allowed himself to believe that this was mission accomplished, that he'd successfully terminated SCP-5683. But his celebration was premature. The spider quickly began reconstituting itself, its body regenerating within the space of 30 seconds. After testing with both stimuli Y220 and Y835, 
Dr. Christensen's frustration seemed to be increasing with each failed attempt. He knew his promotion was within reach, and as far as he could remember, he'd done good work with damaging SCP-682. Why should eradicating this anomalous spider be any different? However, it was a test with stimulus Y-436 that enraged the ambitious doctor. Expecting the anomalous stimulant to turn SCP-5683 into a fine mist, Christensen watched as the creature's body vanished, literally vaporizing, changing states of matter to little more than water in the air. Suddenly, every light in the facility powered off, plunging the testing chamber into darkness. When the lights came back on, SCP-5683 was standing on all eight legs, right where it had been missed only three seconds earlier. The research team had gathered for another mediation, and Dr. Christensen's anger still hadn't subsided. He kicked a chair to emphasize his frustration, alarming junior researcher Silva, who urged him to calm down. After eventually cooling his temper, Christensen made an announcement that caused even greater concern to spread amongst the team. I'm requisitioning Y-910. Researcher Halls and Researcher Miles objected, trying to get Dr. Christensen to realize that the course of this action was excessive, overkill even. But Christensen disregarded them, standing by his latest method for terminating SCP-5683. The Global Occult Coalition had previously used Y-910 to poison gods. He felt sure that it would work on one anomalous giant spider. His time was running short. Dr. Christensen was aware that any day now, the O5 Council would be appointing a replacement director of Site-04, and he wanted that promotion. And he didn't seem to care what corners he cut and what risks he took to get there, even if it meant endangering his research personnel. Dr. Christensen declared that in order to save time, he would be bypassing tissue samples to test for termination attempts. The longer it took to terminate the anomalous arachnid, the more his window of opportunity closed, and the further the director position slipped from his fingertips. Accepting full responsibility for the reckless decision and anything that might go wrong, Dr. Christensen wanted to use Stimulus Y-910 directly on SCP-5683. He urged the research team to make the necessary preparations, unaware of what his decision would lead to and the chaos it had already caused. The test was catastrophic, so much so that it caused a containment breach. With SCP-5683 loose and scuttling about the facility on its multiple legs, Dr. Christensen and junior researcher Silva were forced to rush to the secure bunker on site for safety. Christensen was in a state of panic until he noticed something, and not for the first time either. He'd been detecting a foul smell whenever he'd conducted the meetings to discuss termination options. But the other members of the research team had quickly explained it was nothing more than repeated accidents in the cafeteria. But here was the stench again, worse than ever. Yet junior researcher Silva brushed it off again, stating that SCP-5683 must have gotten into the facility's reactor. The junior researcher quickly became inconsolable, stating that the whole situation was his fault. Dr. Christensen interjected, demanding to know how it was and what Silva had done to cause this situation. He replied that it was his duty to oppose ill-advised actions, and when Christensen had declared his intention to use Y-910, the junior researcher hadn't opposed him. Shifting the blame from himself onto his subordinate, Dr. Christensen chastised Silva over how many personnel had died because of the junior researcher's refusal to do his job, ignoring that it was Christensen's own ambitions that had led to the current chaos. Refusing to be made a scapegoat, Dr. Christensen vowed to pin the full culpability for SCP-5683's containment breach onto junior researcher Silva, saying he'd tell the O5 Council the so-called truth about what had happened. But Silva pointed out that there wasn't much of a likelihood that the bunker would survive the reactor overloading. He urged the ambitious Foundation doctor to admit some responsibility of his own for what had happened, but Christensen refused. Suddenly, there came a thunderous banging at the bunker door. A debilitating pang of fear struck Dr. Christensen, causing him to scream and retreat from the entrance, yelling, no, and please, as if he was pleading with the universe itself to spare him from the spider. Junior researcher Silva walked over to the bunker door, just as strong, arachnid legs tore the heavy steel bulkhead off its hinges, like it was made of little more than wet paper. There was SCP-5683, the enormous spider skittering into the bunker, screeching all the while. 
Silva had put himself between SCP-5683 and the ambitious Foundation Doctor, whose hunger for a promotion had led to all this carnage. The junior researcher announced his noble intention to sacrifice himself, occupying the creature while urging Christensen to run. The doctor shoved Silva towards the spider and prepared to run, then all of a sudden, SCP-5683 vanished. Junior researcher Silva told Dr. Christensen he was disappointed. Before researcher Miles, researcher Hall, and security chief Ade all entered the bunker through the torn open hole where the door had been. Christensen questioned where SCP-5683 had gone, to which Silva explained there was little reason to keep a dummy around once it had served its purpose as a substitute. You mentioned you worked with a lizard, sir, the junior researcher recounted, that there was a containment breach. If you don't terribly mind me asking, how did you escape that situation? It seemed quite lethal, didn't it? Afraid and confused, Dr. Christensen asked where he was. Hall and Miles urged him not to ask questions he already knew the answer to. Silva explained who they all were, a jury, specifically Dr. Christensen's jury, and according to them, the ambitious doctor had disgraced himself again. Christensen had been there for a long time, a considerably long time, reliving the same events over and over again, with SCP-5683 acting as a substitute for SCP-682. It was the same situation, he'd made the same decisions, the same mistakes, and it had cost lives. Now Dr. Christensen was trapped in an endless loop, penance for the casualties that had occurred at his hands, all in the pursuit of his own selfish personal gain. He asked the jury how long he'd be stuck there, a question Silva responded to with, until you take responsibility, sir. Immediately, Dr. Christensen tried to admit that this all had been his fault, but he didn't mean it, not really. He hadn't accepted blame, he just wanted a quick and easy way out of the loop, and the jury of his deceased personnel knew it. Christensen ran for the door in the hopes of escaping his fate. Futile as his chances were, a black iron chain appeared from around the corner and wrapped itself around the overambitious doctor's throat, ignorant of his pleas for forgiveness, saying he was sorry wouldn't bring back the people who died in service of his aspirations to becoming a site director. The chain dragged Dr. Christensen through the facility at such a speed that he collided with every wall and every corner as he turned sharply, being pulled along the floor. But that and the walls quickly crumbled away, revealing a sight that made Dr. Christensen start screaming that it wasn't his fault, and he never really stopped. What followed involved a great deal of blood and fire. Once it was over, it left behind the same awful stench the doctor had smelt before, and he'd soon be smelling it again too, as the cycle repeated itself. The directive had come straight from a member of the O5 Council. They were impressed with Dr. Christensen, and the ambitious Foundation doctor had been hoping to snag a director position at Site-04. But there was one final test for Dr. Christensen to solve the SCP-5683 problem. It was late October of 1993, and John Matthews of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina had just scored a date with Sarah, one of the most popular girls in school and he had planned the perfect night out for the two of them. A haunted house had just been set up in town, and he, like many guys before him, figured he could use that as a chance to impress his date. He had already been through the attraction, so he knew exactly when to put his arm around Sarah when one of the costume actors or animatronics tried to spook them. If any of them got too close for comfort, he might even punch them, just to show Sarah how brave he was. That would be a surefire way to impress any girl. However, John had no idea of the real horror that waited for him and his date through the doors of this seemingly normal funhouse. At first, the haunted house went as normal. John laughed at all the fake cobwebs and plastic skeletons, making sure Sarah knew how dumb he thought they looked. He shoved away actors dressed as axe murderers and told them to stay away from his date. It was dark so they couldn't really see each other's faces. But John guessed that Sarah was probably really impressed. All in all, the date was going well, until they got to a room that John hadn't seen the first time he'd been through. It seemed like it had been added overnight, but at the same time it didn't mesh with the theme. The theme of the haunted house this year was Cannibal Hotel, 
but this room looked more like Dracula's castle, complete with actors dressed as Frankenstein, the Wolfman, and Dracula himself. One of them was even a dead ringer for the actor Vincent Price. John and Sarah watched, confused, as the actors performed their routines which, just like their surroundings, seemed out of place. It was total hackneyed, full of lame puns and very basic scares, though the special effects were undeniably impressive. When John and Sarah walked through the room, the actor dressed as Dracula stood in front of John and started pretending to hypnotize him. Up close, he did look a lot like Bela Lugosi, the actor who'd portrayed the Count during his first big screen appearance. This definitely threw John off a little, but unfortunately, this Dracula didn't have Lugosi's acting talents. You are under my control, Dracula said, waving his fingers at John and staring at him. John, getting really sick of this, pushed the guy out of the way to move on to the next room. But when he did, he felt that something was really, really wrong here. He practically dragged Sarah away from watching the wolfman transform and ran the rest of the way through the house, all of his bravado now gone. Sarah asked her date what was wrong, and he didn't tell her. How could he without sounding crazy? When he had touched that actor playing Dracula, something hadn't felt right. Even through his suit and cape, John had been able to tell that something was wrong. He was cold and rigid, not like a human being, but like a robot or a wax dummy. This is just one of multiple complaints from Halloween attractions around the United States that prompted the action of the SCP Foundation. Several witnesses described either seeing people that resembled classic movie monsters, or living wax models of those monsters appearing in various haunted houses, corn mazes, carnivals, and strip malls across the country. The Foundation has designated this troupe of hammy wax actors SCP-4153. During performances, SCP-4153 used wax to alter their appearance, produce props, including fake blood and gore, and even manipulate wax objects from afar. While this results in some uncanny special effects, the content of the performances tend to be pretty standard classic haunted house fare. They mostly do things like reenacting scenes from classic horror films and telling spooky jokes with a little fake blood here and there. When the Foundation arrived at the Myrtle Beach attraction, they apprehended the various wax characters and determined that their eerie resemblance to the classic horror characters wasn't just makeup. After the horrors some of these Foundation employees had seen on the job, Living wax models of Frankenstein's monster and Dracula seemed almost cute in comparison, and the troupe of wax actors were taken to Site 9 for questioning and containment. The first member of the troupe to be interviewed on site was Dracula, dubbed SCP-4153-017 by the Foundation. He was interviewed by Agent Timothy West, who was totally unimpressed with Dracula's shtick. He tried to hypnotize Agent West, an act which he flatly refused to indulge in. Dracula provided the agent with seemingly no useful information, only responding to questions with cliches like, We were all dead the whole time, and the log was coming from inside the house. The next wax figure to be interrogated was Frankenstein's monster, aka SCP-4153-015, who was interviewed by Agent Samantha Henwick. Much like how SCP-4153-017 stayed fully in character as Dracula during his interview, SCP-4153-015 seemed to really believe that he was actor Boris Karloff, who played Frankenstein's monster in the 1930s. The SCP spoke in an exact imitation of Karloff's voice and speech patterns, and talked to Agent Henwick as if she was another actor on a movie set. He talked about how honored he was to be part of the project, and asked, Are we rolling? when he noticed the conversation was being recorded. Agent Henrik responded to the SCP's comments with confusion, a fact which he took to mean that she was staying in character. Like a true actor, he took a moment to prepare himself before pulling his own head off, much to the horror of Agent Henwick. The last and probably most interesting of the interviews conducted in 1993 was with the wax figure who resembled Vincent Price. More specifically, Vincent Price in his role as Henry Jared in 1953's House of Wax, a movie about a mad sculptor who made wax figures out of the corpses of his victims. This wax figure was designated SCP-4153-036 and was interviewed by Agent Gerald Penn. Penn started the interview with a simple question, why do you try to frighten people? SCP-4153-036 had an equally simple answer, why does anyone try to frighten? 
It's fun to be frightened. Almost as much fun as it is to do the frightening. Penn was skeptical, pointing out that the wax figure's act wasn't especially frightening. The SCP laughed dismissively, telling Penn to have some respect for the classics. Penn was still not having any of it. He had been with the SCP Foundation for 20 years at this point, and he'd seen enough real horror that the so-called classics had no effect on him whatsoever. He pressured Price for answers. But instead of responding with a straight answer, Price launched into a speech about his feelings on monsters. He said, You'll call any oaf with a steak knife hunting gaggles of teens a monster these days. There's no wit, no humor, no charm. Where's the passion? The artisanship? Where's the sense of theater? Would you like to know something peculiar? I've almost never played a monster. Or I've played villains, most certainly, but not monsters. Only men besieged by fate, driven to revenge. Still, I've always had a fondness for them. Even as a child, I sympathize more with the monster than the hero. Agent Penn, who, at this point, was really getting tired of all the theatrics, started to interject. But when he opened his mouth to speak, he was only able to get a few words out before his tongue went numb and rigid in his mouth. He could no longer move it. Agent Penn tried to speak, but his tongue was too solid and heavy to do anything more than knock uselessly against his bottom teeth. He felt something dislodge inside his mouth, and he hoped maybe it was the feeling of his tongue being freed from whatever spell the SCP had put it under. But then he started to feel a tearing and a sticky heaviness in his bottom jaw. Agent Penn reached up and felt around inside his mouth. He started to scream indistinctly when he realized to his horror that his tongue had ripped off. He pulled it out of his mouth, and when he held it in his hand, his fears were confirmed. Somehow it had become nothing more than a lump of pink wax. Now completely tongueless, Agent Penn continued to babble frantically, no doubt trying to curse at the wax creature sitting in front of him. SCP-4153-036 finally paid attention to his interviewer's distress at this point. He turned to Agent Penn with a look of disapproval and disappointment and said, Oh dear, your tongue seems to have gotten away from you there. Here, allow me. The SCP leaned towards Agent Penn, and though the agent wanted to resist, he found that he could no longer move his arms. In fact, his whole body had gone numb and rigid, just like the wax tongue. The only movement he was capable of was opening his mouth, and the wax facsimile of Vincent Price started molding his tongue back to the proper shape, and reattached it inside Agent Penn's mouth. Agent Penn whimpered, unable to do anything while the SCP's hands were in his mouth. The creature said, Hush now, I warned you about this. I told you that you mustn't disturb the wax before it hardens. That is a crucial part of the process. It needs to solidify. Otherwise, you risk disturbing the performance. By the time his tongue was reattached and resealed, Agent Penn was on the verge of tears. He gurgled, gasping for air, wiggling his tongue around in his mouth to make sure that it worked. The SCP returned to his seat, pleased with his own handiwork. Splendid, splendid, good as new. Now, let's take it from the top, shall we? Agent Penn took a deep breath. Steadying himself as SCP-4153-036 whispered the word, ACTION. Penn resumed the interview with the same simple question. Why do you try to frighten people? SCP-4153-036 gave the same simple answer. Why does anyone try to frighten? It's fun to be frightened. Almost as much fun as it is to do the frightening. The interview continued for only a few minutes longer with both parties repeating only things they'd said earlier in the recording. The log ends with SCP-4153-036 once again saying, have some respect for the classics. Not long after the interview concluded, Foundation management completely lost contact with Site-9. A mobile task force was sent in to investigate the cause of this loss of contact, and on arrival, they found a catastrophic oh. containment breach. Not a single member of on-site personnel was found alive, and strangely, all of their bodies seemed to be coated in wax. Further examination revealed that this initial observation wasn't the case at all. They weren't just coated in wax. No, every member of the Site-9 team had all of their major organs, including their skin, surgically extracted and replaced with sculpted wax. 
Of course, this was assumed to be the doing of SCP-4153, but oddly, all of the autopsies suggested that the removal of organs had happened weeks before the apprehension of SCP-4153. Even though all of the on-site personnel had seemed alive and well right up until the containment breach. Outside of being replaced by wax, no damage was done to the bodies. It seemed that everyone had just dropped dead at the same time. There was one body that was different, though. That of Agent Gerald Penn. Agent Penn's decapitated body was found in the same containment cell that had been used for SCP-4153-036. Next to the body was a photograph showing SCP-4153-036 holding up Agent Penn's screaming head and on the back, a single oh. sentence was written. From one horror aficionado to another, always stay ahead. All of the SCP-4153 instances remain unaccounted for, and MTF IOTA-10, also known as the Damn Feds, continue to monitor for new sightings and reports of activity that may be linked to the WAX troop. Hopefully one day, they'll be taken into Foundation custody and contained, and maybe all it will take is for them to meet someone with a sufficient appreciation for the classics. Now for something from the more terrifying archives of the SCP Foundation, check out SCP-096, The Shy Guy, or SCP-106, The Old Man.